Hello and good morning everybody and welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen Evans. I'm the Chief Executive of the Learning and Work Institute and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to today's Housing, Learning and Work Conference which um, we're holding uh, jointly with our friends at Communities uh, That Work. Um, it's great that we've got so many hundreds of you um, signed up uh, today and hoping for lots of lively debate um, in the chat as well as a great lineup of uh, speakers. Um, today's conference is being uh, recorded so just uh, just a kind of uh, reminder and warning uh, about that um, and I'd like to also start by thanking um, our sponsors um, who really do enable um, today's event to go ahead so a huge thank you to Southern Housing and to Sovereign and to Fusion 21 as well. And to kick us off this morning, we're going to now just see a short video from uh, Fusion 21. Fusion 21 are a national social enterprise that exists to deliver social impact. And we do that in a number of different ways. So we do it in partnership with our public sector members through their procurement activity by supporting them to procure with purpose and embedding social value in all our frameworks and all our procurement contracts. We are proud to support our members to procure with purpose, ensuring that every project delivered by our supply chain generates social value you can see. Social impact is the positive benefit that is experienced by an individual. Fusion 21 are a national social enterprise that exists to deliver social impact and we do that in a number of different ways. So we do it in partnership with our public sector members through their procurement activity by supporting them to procure with purpose and embedding social value in all our frameworks and all our procurement contracts. We are proud to support our members to procure with purpose, ensuring that every project delivered by our supply chain generates social value you can see. Social impact is the positive benefit that is experienced by an individual or in a community as a result of a project or initiative. Social impact is something that's always been there for Fusion 21. Social value, social impact is a huge part of our offer. Fusion 21 recently launched the new DCARB framework and our social value offer linked to that framework is very much focused on green skills and new employment opportunities linked to DCARB and sustainability. So we know there's a gap at the moment that there aren't enough skilled workers to be able to deliver the amount of work that's required around DCARB and sustainability. As a socially responsible business, what we're trying to do is to make sure that those opportunities are driven into communities where they're needed most. Passion might not be a word that people automatically connect with procurement, but when you see the changes you can make to the lives of local people and local communities, it's easy to understand why everyone at Fusion 21 is so passionate about the work that they do. We're here to guide you on your social impact journey. Together, we can build a brighter future that serves your local community more profoundly. Fabulous. Um, so that's a um, great introduction there to from Fusion uh, 21. And I uh, don't know if it was just me, one or two little glitches on the video at the start there. So apologies uh, for that. And if it was just me, then I'm basically apologising to myself for my own Wi-Fi. Um, so there you go. We'll edit that out if needs be afterwards with the recording. 
Um, so as I say, huge thank you to Fusion 21 and to Southern Housing and to Sovereign uh, for their support uh, for this um, event. Um, just a, a few words by way of introduction from me uh, now, because uh, we've got a really packed agenda. We've got loads of stuff um, to get through. I thought I'd just kind of frame the discussion a little bit. And in particular, drawing on a report um, that uh, we published that we, we produced jointly with IES that was um, kindly commissioned by uh, communities that work in the National Housing Federation and the National Federation of ALMOs, which is called Building Opportunity. And if uh, if the LNW team are, are sort of uh, listening, maybe we can just post the, the link to that into the, uh, into the Q&A. Um, but that really helped to set out some of the national context, but also how housing and social housing fits within that. So we've got a, a, a slightly weird labour market, is, is my technical economist term, where we've got um, really high levels of vacancies. They're starting to drop off uh, a little bit. Of course, it varies around the country. Um, but we've got one million fewer people in the labour market than if pre-pandemic trends had continued because we've had growth in economic inactivity. So people out of work and either not looking for work or not available to start work. Um, and that's a kind of really important context. And we're going to um, see in the budget in mid-March, the Chancellor announced the government's plans for doing something about this um, and trying to expand the workforce and get those who want to come back to work um, um, to, to, to be able to do so. Um, and social housing and social housing tenants have got a really huge role to play in that. Um, the Building Opportunity Report that I mentioned um, found that around one in four of all economically inactive people in the country are living in social housing. So if you want to do something about reducing economic inactivity, well, you've got to work with social housing and people living in social housing. Also showed really big um, disparities between groups as well. We see in the in the country as a whole. So people with uh, disabilities or low levels of qualifications um, or lone parents, for example, uh, much less likely to work than the average. So how do we reduce some of those inequalities? And also those employment rates varying across the country as well. So if you want to uh, level up to coin a phrase, well, you need to work with social housing. So there was a load of um, uh, excellent stats and graphs that made me very happy, albeit they, um, they kind of frame a challenge, but also some brilliant examples in there of the work that um, social housing providers are doing to help people into work, help their residents um, into work and to progress on and to get stable hours and to, to build their earnings as well. So I think for me, that says that um, social housing tenants and social housing uh, providers need to be a really big part of the plan for how we build an inclusive uh, labour market, how we meet our future needs. And actually, going back to the video that you just saw there, and we'll be, we'll be talking about this today, this isn't just about where we are now or the after effects of the pandemic. This is about the next 20, 30, 40 years. And we heard about you know, transitions, or we're going to hear more about transitions to net zero um, and, and green skills and how do we um, how do we make that transition? You know, housing and social housing is a huge part of that transition. And actually, tenants uh, can be accessing some of the jobs created through doing that as well. So there's a huge set of challenges, but a huge set of opportunities, I think, and some really brilliant examples that, again, we'll hear from throughout the day as well, throughout the conference um, of where um, people are already making a huge difference. So it's how do we do more of that? How do we build that in? How do we expand it? Um, so that's all I wanted to say by way of uh, introduction from me. So as I said um, at the start, we do this conference in partnership with our friends at Communities uh, That Work. And so I'm delighted to be able to pass across to the Managing Director of Communities That Work, uh, Lindsay Sweeney. So Lindsay, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning. Uh, good morning, Stephen, and good morning, um, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for taking time to join us this morning. Um, this is, I think, this is our fourth um, conference with the Learning and Work Institute. We did one just before COVID in Toynbee Hall in London, so an in-person event, and then we rolled onto online. And um, I've seen the 
Of course, there are pros and cons to these things, but we know that in terms of delegate attendance and the accessibility of the information we're sharing and, and the partnerships we're showcasing, we know it's better online. So thank you for taking time out of, of your days, everybody, as our delegates and, and joining us in your hundreds this morning. We hope you can stay through the agenda and as always in these um, conferences, pick out the, the areas that resonate mostly with you and, and take away some actions and some ideas and hopefully feel feel buoyed up and inspired to keep on, on working in the areas that you're working in. Um, uh, for, for colleagues at Learning and Work and, and Stephen, thank you for referencing our report, Building Opportunity. Um, I've, I've dropped that into the chat box and I hope everyone can see that. Um, that is just one report, and we know there's a sea of reports uh, at any point, and many uh, reports at the moment around economic inactivity and what can what can be done and, and what the pressures are on, on government. Um, but it is a really important report for us and for the sector. We delivered that in partnership. We commissioned it in partnership with the National Housing Federation and the NatFed of Almo. So it really was a cross-sector um, initiative and piece of research and it shows the commitment really of of all the main trade bodies in social housing to this area of work and you know I know from from colleagues in housing um, there's never uh, I think a time where everyone feels that we're living in clover but at the moment it feels particularly pressured and there's a lot of um, strong headwinds coming into the sector, a lot of reputational risk and a lot of work that needs to be done in uh, across a lot of fronts. So we know it's tough times out there, but we also know that um, our sector is actually remaining committed um, to helping working age people uh, across their tenants and resident bases into work, into a proper sustainable livelihood, decent earnings, decent progression. But those things take time um, and the housing sector is a patient partner. Um, so we are not looking at one to three years of, of funding or change in order to engage in a project. We work, our business plans work across decades. And I think um, although that can uh, make things feel somewhat slow in activity and action, it actually makes us a very patient uh, partner. We're there for the long term and we are investing in our communities of all ages, but in particular of working ages uh, to support our tenants and residents into um, a better livelihood and better life chances. So even now, um, that commitment is being maintained. Our, our recent uh, Communities That Work members survey attested to that. But we know that there are pressures ahead. And I, I think if I were to really ask for anything and hope for anything in the spring budget and in the autumn statement that's coming through this year, where we know the government is very, very mindful of economic inactivity, its effect on um on our gross domestic product, our gross value added as a as a nation, and and is really um, at, at the top of the government's agenda in terms of of restarting the economy and trying to get more jobs and people moving. If we can't make this headway now and this year, I, I don't you know I I don't know when we can. I think we will make headway, but we're asking for clearer understanding from government of the role of social housing and clearer opportunities to partner. So funding always matters. And of course, with the end of um, European money and the sort of gradual emergence of other funding, there's been some flux and some uncertainty. But it's not only or solely about money. A, a partnership really is what is required, number one, for planning, um, for joint funding and investment in communities. And the social housing sector is not the only partner. There are health, education, all in the mix but we're all there for the long term and we will be so much stronger together working in local partnership. So um, the, the agenda reflects that and, and we hope that um, we focused on areas which feel really pertinent to where we are right now, but also looking ahead. So we're looking at uh, local power, local opportunity and also green future, green jobs, um, plus our two breakouts. So um, I'm hoping that you've all seen the agenda. The link would have been sent to you with your joining information this morning. So do take a moment to browse through that. And please, um, if you are into social media, please use um, the hashtag, which is I say madly looking for it is I think hashtag learning and work. But I'll, I'll double check that and make sure I put it in the chat box. But if you are minded, hashtag housing, learning and work. How could I forget the word housing? 
hashtag housing learning work. So please use that mention, um, you know, uh, pass on your comments through social media as well. We will be looking at that through this morning. And the agenda hopefully is fairly straightforward for you all. Um, you can see um, we have two plenaries with a break in the middle, um, starting um, any moment now with um, uh, our chair from Fusion 21. And then we have two key breakouts um, in the mid morning. Um, and then we come straight into, so I'd ask for a really quick return, please, from those breakout sessions to our keynote speech, which is from uh, Deputy Mayor of London, Tom Copley, at 12.15. And then we go to closing remarks and we will have you away to your the next part of your day by 1pm, by the close. So I hope that all makes sense to you. Do stay active on socials and we'll keep an eye on that. And I think without uh, further ado, I hope you enjoy the morning and um, I'd like to hand over to Sarah Maguire, Social Value Lead at Fusion 21, blog writer extraordinaire and ah. star of the video this morning. So um, I'll ask for your signature later, Sarah, but I'm looking forward to this plenary. Over to you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Lindsay. What an introduction. Good morning, everybody, and welcome, a very warm welcome to the First session at the conference today, I'm Sarah Maguire and I am the Social Value Lead at Fusion 21 and I am genuinely delighted to be chairing the panel this morning and Fusion 21 are really delighted to be headline sponsors of the event. Um, you've seen in the introductory video this morning that Fusion 21 are a national social enterprise and employment and skills pathways to work is a huge focus of the work that we do and a huge part of our social value offer. Um, one of the big things that we're looking at at the moment is opportunities around green skills linked to our decarb framework and um, we're taking a slightly different approach to dealing with some of those challenges we're looking at place shaping opportunities across a wider area to connect public sector organizations with employers with housing associations who have access to tenants that we think could really benefit from some of these um, opportunities so really exciting uh, work that's happening at Fusion 21 and I'm really proud to head up the social value team there. So the panel this morning uh, will focus on green skills and on the role of employers in helping to shape the future labour market as we move towards net zero and also how education and training providers can equip the future workforce with the skills that they need. And then lastly, and really crucially for this session, how housing associations can mobilise to support tenants to access uh, these green skills opportunities. I am delighted to be joined by just a brilliant group of panellists in this session who live and breathe this stuff in everything that they do. So I'll shortly ask them to introduce themselves. But before I do, the 2022 Housing and Learning uh, and Work Conference was a real highlight for me last year, full of fresh ideas around creating and sustaining employment opportunities, but also really honest about some of the challenges that make unlocking that potential really difficult. I and the panel who are joining me this morning want this to be a really lively session and that will only happen with really brilliant contributions from you in the audience so please do post your questions uh, maybe you've come with a question maybe there's a question you've always wanted to ask around green skills or you may hear uh, the panelists speaking and think I wish they'd said a bit more about that, I wish they'd, they'd gone in that direction. So weird, wonderful questions, all very, very welcome. And I will do my best in the session to get through as many as possible. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, the panel. Amy, I'll hand over to you first, please. Hi, um, my name's Amy Holbrook. I am um, a bid and responsible business manager for British Gas. Um, the social housing arm so it's British Gas Social Housing Trading as PH Jones is the full title it's a bit of a mouthful but PH Jones or British Gas is fine um my background is essentially in anything to do with climate change and sustainability and I've bobbed around British Gas doing different jobs until about 18 months two years ago where I landed myself 
in a sort of diversified role outside of my bid management role, looking at social value and everything that comes with it from the bid proposals through to actually making sure we do stuff that we commit to in bids. Um, and part of that is helping with the net zero transition, making sure that we're utilising social value to deliver green jobs um, and also um, helping clients identify um, their net zero strategy and linking in with our um, net zero business development managers. So I see it from the suppliers side of things but I also see it from the social value side of things um so from both sort of perspectives thank you Amy and Rob I will hand over to you next morning everyone uh, I'm Rob Sutton I'm head of communities at Hat. apologies for the slightly husky voice I'm hoping it holds out uh, for the uh, for the next hour or so but um, yeah really nice to be here um, uh, as I mentioned I work for Hat, which is the housing association charitable trust which will probably be familiar to, to many of you um, and and I lead on our work through the centre of excellence and community investment um, and the, the big pleasure of that role is I get to spend lots of time talking to lots of different housing associations about the wide range of community investment activities and programs programs they do and, and green skills and the net zero kind of opportunities has been a big part of that conversation lately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been involved in around making the most of, of the kind of the, the race to, to net zero and, and to, to share some of those great examples of, of collaboration and working together that are starting to happen. Thank you, Rob. That's brilliant. And David, finally, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm David Pierpoint. I'm the Chief Executive and Founder of the Retrofit Academy. Uh, we're a community interest company that has a mission to train 200,000 competent retrofitters by the end of this decade, uh, and probably a few hundred thousand more before the end of uh, 2050, when we <laughs> the ultimate objective and target. Um, I'm going to be explaining a lot more about our work shortly, so I'll uh, leave it there. That's brilliant. Thank you so much to the three of you. And I am really confident with the breadth of experience in the virtual room that we'll have a really lively discussion this morning. Um, to the audience, please do have a think about the questions that you want to ask of our panellists and please do start posting them uh, so we can uh, get through as many as possible in the time that we have. Um, I will selfishly uh, use my chair's prerogative to ask a few questions before we uh, move to audience questions. So I think to start, I'm going to ask a, a really broad question uh, to the three of you, if that's okay, just to ask you to share some examples of what good looks like. So what is it that you see at the moment that's happening that is brilliant in this space. Um, Rob, I'll come to you first, if that's okay on that one. Of course, and I think, and and, and had to have been involved in, in, a, in a piece of work and that's um, the, the, that was made possible by Fusion 21, uh, along with TPAS and, and Hair East, or something called the, the Just Green Transition. Uh, and it's a bit of, kind of, anyone who knows Hack knows that kind of the work we do is is we're, we're very much about kind of trying to build collaboration, about supporting the sector to kind of make the most of social value and also where we can to kind of get some ideas going and 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 generate some some discussion around it. And so the Just Green, Just Green Transition paper was an opportunity to do that and really kind of showcase where we think there's some brilliant stuff happening across the sector already. And and, and there was a few that, that kind of really We've, we've profiled with case studies and I'll, I'll post a links to a couple of these as well but I think some things that are really standing out for us at the moment is there's some just brilliant collaborative work happening things like the the greener hearts partnership in um in Hertfordshire which is um I, I think is a, a a collaboration of um uh Settle B3 and Watford Housing. Um, they've invested in a, in a joint kind of sustainability lead. They're bringing together their work and, and opportunities around this. And similarly with the Greener Future Partnership, which is Abri Anchor Home Group and the Hyde Group and, and along with Sanctuary. 
organizations coming together to kind of set out joint strategies, pull together some of the conversations around what are the, the challenges and skills needs that we need to do here and starting to design and develop and kind of build programs uh, to together around that to coordinate activities and to share that learning as well. And I think that's that's a really brilliant piece. I mean, the the, the one we often kind of talk of and share with the show and really kind of bold leadership and really excited around this. An example I love is, is the work that Bolton at Home have been doing with their uh, their Greenworks um, project, which essentially Bolton at Home have, have kind of recognising that there was a that, that there's a need here in, in Bolton and, and perhaps there wasn't um, immediately the, the kind of the the supply chain and the infrastructure kind of around them to, to start going on this work. They've said, well, we'll be one of the first organizations to lay down a market to kind of do this stuff. They've bought a dis, uh, a uh, in, industrial estate, started to set up their own kind of facilities and plants to start manufacturing some of the, the materials and um, prefabricated home and things like that, some of the work to, to do there, but also putting on that site a green skills training academy, um, locating some of their kind of community outreach work, and then opening up an invitation to the wider greater Manchester region to say, come and get involved, come and locate your stuff here. And, and people are coming, and soon that's going to be a really fantastic hub for this kind of work starting to, to come together. And I think that's the really powerful thing that housing associations can do in this is there is the flexibility and creativity to say, we're going to be, we're, we're going to put a market down here come with us on the journey yeah I, I I agree with that Rob I think that's something that that Bolton have done really well and certainly my observations at the time were that a lot of housing associations and public sector organizations actually include, include uh, Fusion 21 in this statement we were we were on the starting line wanting to set off but not quite sure what it looked like what it felt like what the collaborations what the partnerships needed to be Bolton just got on and did it and they've had some brilliant successes as a result um David I'll come to you with the same question if that's okay just 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 your insights into what's working that's that's brilliant at the moment and what good looks like okay uh do you mind if I talk about something we we're doing no go for it oh, uh, um so last year we delivered two essentially retrofit supply chain uh, program sort of accelerated programs which uh, tapped into something called the government's community renewal fund which was leveling up funding um we had one of those in essex and one in devon um and they were partners they were joint projects with the local authorities who uh sort of as as with just about every local authority and city in the country has objectives around green and housing stock that they want to see decarbonized and they want to see the social value of that captured locally um and those those projects enabled us to do what I think most people know us as, as a, in terms of training a lot of people very well to carry out the key roles of retrofit coordinator, retrofit assessor, retrofit advisor. So the white collar roles that are needed to uh, sort of get large scale programs moving. So to carry out the assessments, to come up with the plans and designs to to get to, to get homes decarbonized. Um, and as a result of that, there's obviously now two or 300 trained and qualified people in the, both of those counties who are able to be fed directly into the workforce that local authorities and housing associations, those areas uh, now need, because what's happened since the start of that project at the beginning of last year is a load of government funding has come into the world of social housing retrofit and local authority led fuel poverty led retrofit, which requires those people. Um, so um, I'd love to say that was part of a grand government vision for how this should be done. It, it wasn't. It was a series of serendipitous coincidences with uh, forward-thinking local authorities and social landlords in those areas working with an actor like us who, who's sort of anxious to make stuff happen. Um, so they were, they were excellent programmes. Uh, unfortunately, um, as with most government programmes, they come to a very abrupt end and uh, legacy from them is very difficult so that's that's something we're we're currently wrestling with how how you do more of that kind of stuff at scale um, but i'm sure we'll come to that later yeah i'm sure we will thanks thanks so much david and amy i will come to you before jumping into questions from the audience if that's okay yeah so what does good look like for us in terms of actually putting um we all specialise in things like the air source heat pump side of things net zero at the moment, but are looking to diversify uh, further to be able to do whole house. But at the moment, 
the best good I can sort of give you an example of is with Broadacres Housing Association. So it's one of we've always done air force heat pumps, but they've been standalone um contracts. Like we did about fifteen hundred for Dumfries and Galloway a few years ago, and now it's becoming more. It's just becoming more. It's more regular. Um, they're bigger contracts. They're all over the country, so that's our challenge. And where do you get the staff from? So for Broadacres, we took some of our existing gas engineers and we worked with the client to basically upskill those engineers to gain FGAS qualifications. And we really learned on our feet how to do that. And it was a bit of a testing ground, really, because it was one of the first in sort of this new sort of net zero world where we were doing that. That original team is all qualified now. And we're really meeting all the KPIs, the quality is brilliant, everything's passing, what it should. Really work closely with the um with the client to the point now where we've took on another set of um engineers to do some more work for them. And we're basically passing down those skills and widening it out. So originally they were internal teams that started doing the work, but then it's those new teams have been recruited from the local area. One was an existing gas engineer for a different business that wanted to diversify. So he now works as our lead um, engineer on that contract. Another was a plumber. Um, oh, no, we've trained him to be a plumber. He was previously working in a solicitor's office in an administration role. So he's come in and diversified his um, role. And another was a gas um, smart meter engineer that wanted to go into the renewables world. But they're all from that footprint of a client and we've upskilled them and we're sort of like paying it forward as we go on that contract. And that's how we're working at the moment. From a social value point of view, I would like to get more um, people further away from the job market into those roles and really make social value um, contribute to the net zero workforce going forward. But I think we'll probably cover that. <laughs> going forward, so I won't go into too much detail on it. Yeah, it's a fine line, isn't it, Amy? I'm asking yeah. questions. Don't give me everything right now. Save something for, for um later. They are brilliant observations and I I echo what you said around attracting new talent, um, you know, to be able to fulfill some of these jobs. No amount of of uh, retraining existing members of staff will will get us through this green skills um, employment uh, crisis. Um, and I love the idea of paying it forward. I think that's a really nice model. Um, I will ask a question from the audience. So the question is, do we know enough about the green skills that are needed? And I think um, that's a question about the extent to which how are employers future forecasting uh, some of their green skills needs are they looking long term enough or are we dealing with an immediate crisis now and then hoping that everything else will fall into place but, but do we know enough um, about the green skills that are needed Rob I'm going to come to you first in the hope that your voice is is holding <laughs> and I'm giving you a little bit of a breast uh, and, and I'm happy to kind of kick started and I might also uh, then, then hand over to David if that's okay because uh, it, it links to a piece of work that actually had to involve him um, alongside the Retrofit uh, Academy. So it's a good question. And I think part of the, it's, there's, there's never going to be a perfect time, right? To, to kind of, the, it, the, the, the message kind of running through our just green kind of transition paper is, is start now, like be intentional, get going. And I think We've certainly picked up a little bit of this kind of through the Centre for Excellence and some of the places where we operate. It's like there's been so many crises lately, kind of if you go from COVID to cost of living, if you go from building safety to damp and mould, so there's, there's a lot going on. And it's really easy to kind of prioritise on those because they are really big, important issues and they need attention. And to kind of have net zero in the corner, kind of that this is coming and we know we need to do about it, but we're only so big, we're only so well resourced, we can only focus on so many things. But there's a real danger that 2030 comes around very quickly and, and maybe people would have wished or maybe we should have started some of these kind of conversations or some of this work kind of earlier. So with the, the, the big call we kind of put out is, is start now get going, be intentional, kind of going with some of this work. And it's okay to be figuring it out 
and and kind of going on a, a bit of a journey and and that's why we really advocate for the con collaboration piece as well you do not need hundreds of housing associations trying to figure this out individually and then sharing notes a few years kind of later down the line there's this this collaborative bits of work of people coming together mapping kind of what's happening in their areas mapping what's kind of coming around the corner for them thinking about what their supply chains and skill sets and workforces and all those things look for look like and and starting to kind of go on that journey together and, and hacks we're, we're really pleased to be kicking off a piece of work in bournemouth christchurch and and pool which is is around green skills it's a it's a two and a half year piece of work um it's been made possible from um some funding from the the jp morgan foundation and, and is bringing us together with sovereign abri bournemouth churches astor and, and stonewater so a collection of housing associations kind of covering those three combined local authorities with with the aim of, of supporting 150 people into to new jobs and, and opportunities or to reskill or to advance within the kind of green skills sector. Um, and that's a two and a half year piece of work. And, and we won't do a single bit of training for the first six months because it's this piece of work, first and foremost, to understand where everybody's at, what everybody's ambitions are, but to kind of do that bit of looking around locally, around where's the, the need, where's the opportunities, what are the courses and things like that available. And we're very fortunate to have an excellent organization called Retrofit Academy kind of working alongside us on some of that work. And that's maybe why I should kind of sigo over to, to David to talk a bit about um, where they kind of bring some of that help in. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'll talk slightly more broadly, if I may, around that question than, than just that one project, vital though it is, and excited about it though we are. Um, the answer to the questions, yes. We, we know exactly, in terms of heat, home decarbonization and retrofit, we know exactly what we need. It's not, um, it's not difficult to work out, but you might not know exactly what we might need by 2030 or 2040 or 2050, but God knows we've got enough to get on with in the meantime. And there's enough work out there uh, to create a lot of high value jobs and a lot of high value careers and, and get a lot of good quality work done. And I'll briefly outline why. The, the, the reason we've got that clarity is because there are now clear standards in place under which all social housing and local authority-led retrofit must be delivered. And that makes it very clear what the roles are. Um, and we've also now got funding uh, aligned with those standards. And that funding, whilst occasionally government may do things that make us want to pull our hair out in terms of timescales and ambition, it's very clear that those schemes are, 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 are moving us towards retrofit solutions that are fabric first, involve decarbonizing the heat system particularly through things like heat pumps and include an element of of adding in renewables like solar pv and 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 so on and so forth so um it's really clear what white collar and blue collar roles we need um and 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 i would strongly encourage the the, the world of social housing to move on from that sort of a question valid though it is <laughs> to to actually getting on and doing it because um because when all these social housing decarbonisation fund projects get going, um, which is just a matter of weeks now, you're going to need that labour force really, really quickly uh, just to get on with what we've currently got on the table and to utilise the funding that's available. So, so yes, we do. Um, when you look at the wider context of green skills, that's a whole different thing. And, and part of the problem, I was at a, a, an event last week with the Chancellor and the Energy Secretary, they see green as meaning everything from domestic energy efficiency to nuclear. Um, and uh, and that, that is a whole different kettle of fish. But home decarbonisation, we know exactly what we need. It's so refreshing, David, to have a very straightforward answer to a question. So that's, that's brilliant. The answer is yes. And I think you've articulated a really brilliant call to action there around just, just getting started and, and um, yeah. Uh, Amy, did you want to come in finally on behalf of British Gas? I am interested to know to what extent you're looking forwards and, and analysing what it is that you're going to need in your workforce over the next five, ten years. OK, so, yeah, we've set up a whole new business unit. To ta Can anyone else see my camera going funny or is it just on mine? It is a bit glitchy, Amy, but we can still <laughs> we can hear, hear you. OK, right, that's fine. I'll turn the video off and see if it'll um, come back. Yeah. Um, we've set up a whole new business unit essentially to tackle this um, whole work, new work stream. 
um i'm just gonna turn off it's too distracting <laughs> um so yeah we've got a whole new business unit with specialized um well, specialists working in there they are um anything from we've got a director to a whole team of business development managers that are working with clients to help them understand what those first steps are what's important to them looking at their housing stock that kind of thing and they are responsible for working out our pipeline setting those standards in place and making sure that we've got the workforce there for the next five ten years however that may look I'm not close enough to that detail in my role to give you any sort of (laughs) further sort of figures on that or anything like that but that is specifically their job and I echo everything that Rob and David have said um Michelle Obama said in one of her recent book promo (laughs) um tours that if you think about something that's so big sometimes makes you not want to do anything you know you think about climate change it puts the fear of God into you and it's oh god it's too big of a thing for me to contribute to and she referred to it being like knitting you know to start pearl by pearl chipping away at and eventually you've got a scarf well eventually then your housing stock and you've made that net zero transition by taking it step slowly doing it step by step and we absolutely echo what the other um, two speakers have said and that's the right approach um and our specialists are there in the same way that hacked is in the same way that um david's team are to help people do that and analyze and understand what their first step should be that's brilliant thank you amy of all the things i expected in the session this morning a michelle obama knitting analogy <laughs> one of those things so that's that's brilliant, but it's 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 great, and I think it emphasises the point really well. And we have lots of internal conversations about Infusion Twenty One about the fact that this is big and it can feel really big, and that does make it hard to know how to approach it and what to do. Um, first, I think the reason I asked that question about what does good look like now in this space is because there are some brilliant examples of organisations just getting themselves off the. Um, starting blocks there's a question here from somebody in a a comms role so the question is around how we tell people about great decarb schemes and how important is it to tell people what we're doing and what works best and I think if I made that's a, a slightly bigger question about how do we advocate for these green skills opportunities and do we have yet a common understanding around language uh, and definitions uh, David I know you and I have talked about this um, before but it was a while ago so I am interested to know if, if some of that thinking has moved on I'll come to you first because you're smiling okay. <laughs> well no I don't think we do have a um, a common lexicon or um, and, and I get told off for calling our organization the retrofit academy we're told we should we should we should be something more more user friendly or public friendly. I mean, uh, that that may or may not end up being the case. I think if you if you look back through history, you know, people didn't know what the seed drill was until everyone started using the seed drill. Um, so we, we, it's it's not clear what the future vernacular will be. I don't think. Um, what is clear is the way in which that whatever that is called is communicated to for example social housing residents or or in our world young people which are the people we're competing to to train and bring into the sector um it, it's it's it, the way in which that needs to be done um needs to be changed so i'm not so fussed about the words as the way it's communicated so you know we've become really good at TikTok, um which well not me <laughs> but, but that's that's part part of the challenge um we've also developed something called the retrofit careers hub which is an online portal um, where anyone interested in any in, in coming into the sector can can visit and both find out sort of information about what a career retrofit might involve, what the professions and trade roles might be, and, and, and work out which is right for them. On the one hand, also meet potential employers who are desperate to find talent. I mean, if if anyone on the call is unsure whether there is a work. Uh, uh, an employer group keen to employ people with the right skills and competence don't don't, don't worry about that 
um if we if we could we couldn't train enough people to to meet demand but it's, it would be almost impossible to train enough people to meet employer demand um but the point i wanted to make around that careers hub and communication is we found it's it's through it's through videos with people narrated by people who drop their t's basically so they don't want to hear from old fogies like me they, they want to hear from from people they can connect with and, and so so we've gone on a bit of a, a, a communications journey of discovery around that and that's um taking shape that's really helpful. Amy, are there any observations from you on that that question? Um, can you remind me what the question was? Sorry, I wrote down advocate green yeah, jobs. Sorry. It's a question about it's quite a broad question to be honest, Amy. How do we advocate for um green jobs? And also do we have a common language? And I suppose from you, it would be interesting to get your reflections on your interactions as a, a socially responsible business with public sector organisations in particular in the way that they procure and the way that they ask for some of these green skills opportunities. Yeah, so. There's again, it's two parts. So when you're looking at procuring um, any sort of retrofitting contract at the moment, we're struggling to get added value as in social value in them because they're quite small, low value. So our biggest challenge straight off the bat is just resourcing the contract. Get the air source heat pumps in the properties, make sure the job is done to good standard, which is the first challenge, which is exactly what that business unit is looking for. But in terms of targeting new jobs and apprenticeships and that kind of thing, these contracts that are coming out need to be of a big enough long enough duration and size to warrant those additional skills through social value so for example if you took somebody at the minute and David might correct me but this is my understanding somebody fresh off the street um maybe needs long-term unemployed quite far away from an engineering background no skills in the area for example there are a couple of different routes for them. The biggest one would be an apprenticeship. So we've worked with MCS to try and create a heat pump installation apprenticeship. But that in itself will take a couple of years. Um, if they were to, like right now, today, they'd have to do a plumbing um, and gas installation um, apprenticeship. And then we would upskill them. And that in itself, the, the first apprenticeship takes three to four years so when you're looking at immediate social impact and social value for the contract that's the kind of duration you're looking at because if you're only doing it for a year what are we going to do how do we take somebody and give those skills pass on that knowledge if the contract's not long enough so my ask when you're ready to look at those big sort of install contracts is make them long enough for training to take place to bring somebody who has no skills and give them the skills um, and also make it mandatory as part of the contract because if it's not in there people aren't going to add the value because it costs money to train people it costs money to pay the apprentice wages and all those kinds of things um, so you make it mandatory then everyone that's tendering has to do it and that that would be my sort of call out for it yeah that that's excellent Amy thank you it really useful insight into you know your your day job and what you experience and what you get back from public sector organizations and the way that we procure and commission we've lost rob i do think he's rejoining uh oh you're back i was worried you'd had some kind of coughing fit and you'd had to jump off but you're, you're back so that's brilliant um are you okay <laughs> It was just a connection failure. I, oh, I didn't come no. into the office and, and it still failed me. So oh, uh, there we go. Really. Apologies. That's all right. So um, I'm going to move on to the next question. And it, it segues really nicely from the conversation we've just had. So the question is, do the panel think that the timescales and funding envelopes of the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund encourage or discourage contractors to invest in skills so I think Amy that links to what you were saying about some of the short-term funding streams do the panel think that they uh, drive the right behaviours David I'll come to you first if that's okay okay that, no problem at all uh, yeah I think they broadly do um, and, the, and the reason for that is 
for a start, it's it's unusual for government. It's not a one year program; it's a two year program. Um, and also, they've been um, not. I don't often talk positively about conservative government policy, but on, on this front, they've been very cl clear that there's a long term commitment to the SHDF program. There is. There, they said in the manifesto there'd be five billion pounds. As it stands at the minute, it looks like there'll be six billion pounds, and they've with with a few challenges they stayed true to that they're, they're far more committed to retrofit and social housing than they are to other sectors where actually they don't they don't feel as confident that it's going to succeed so i think that that whilst uh, two years we'd love two years to be five years and 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 so on and so forth but the signals are very clear um the targets in around achieving epc ban c by 2030 is very clear and yes they have in the past a very checkered record of changing or scrapping targets at the last minute cheesing everybody off but what's changed is we're much closer to 2050 than we used to be <laughs> and they're going to start breaking the law if they keep doing things like that so i don't think the signals for, for, from government are anything other than we need to do more of this we need to do it well we need to do it by the standards we need to do it through a no in a no regrets sort of low risk way um and um i think i think the social housing sector should feel pretty confident that it, it in in you know you should be making a long term strategic commitment to retrofit and you should be building the capabilities and and whilst i i i, I sympathize with with um with amy's point of view and and i'd uh, I, again we'd all like longer term and certainty and i completely agree with what you're saying around procurement and contracts amy i also think it's incumbent on, upon the supply chain to make that commitment too because you do stand to make an awful lot of money out of this if you can get it right which isn't a bad thing but there is some element of commercial risk taking that needs to happen in order to enable that. One thing's for sure is if you don't have the labour force with the right skills and the right competences at the right time, you won't maximise that commercial opportunity either. So, so you know, I would encourage both sides to sort of say, yeah, now is the time. Let's let's get on with it. And Rob, from your point of view, conversations that you're having uh, across the sector. I haven't got too much to add to, to, to what David said there, really. Apart from I know that when we've been kind of interfaced with with Bayes or have been at events, they've kind of recognised that this is new avenues of work and there's learning and, and things like that going along as well. So that, that there's there's been commitments there to kind of sharing and reviewing and kind of having dialogue. And I think there's there's a few kind of some of these these established partnerships that are coming from from the sector are are getting the airs of some of those kind of providers to be able to have some of those conversations around where this is working and what kind of is the longer term vision uh, as well. Um, but yeah, and uh, obviously the, we could be coming up to a general election hmm. in the next year or so that might change some of that again as well. So it's kind of, it, it's, but it's, uh, yeah, there's enough to work with now, I would say, to be like David says, to kind of be making those plans and doing things. And it's it's around net zero and those targets but there's a whole kind of wider piece around sustainability and, and climate change and those kind of commitments that this all plays into as well that the, the sector really should be embracing and committing to yeah that's brilliant so I, i'm going to move us on to uh cover a few more questions if that's okay uh for the audience we have about 10 minutes left in this session so if there are any uh questions that you want to ask please do post them in the chat and and again we'll we'll try and get through them as best um we can i want to move the conversation on so now focusing on the link between employers and employability programs, and maybe particularly those that are supported by housing associations. So a, a question that's been asked is, how effective have the panelists found the links between employers recruiting into uh, the green skills economy and the employability support um, that exists? And the, the person asking the question references specific programs, so Restart and ESF. So it's it's a question about the link between employees recruiting into these roles and the um, employability support programs that exist. Rob, I'll come to you first on that one. If you could share some reflections across the sector, you've shared some brilliant examples already of, of partnership work, but just just your reflections on on that question, please. So I think, and yeah, 
So it's early days for the piece of work that we're just starting in BCP. That, that's going to be in the next few months where we start to identify who um, some of the employers are and, and, and where to tailor that. I think One Manchester are a really good example to look to for some early work around this. Um, uh, they, uh, they've been involved in, in a bit of a programme around green skills for the last year or two. And I think they found... I, I, I think they will share kind of generously around the early days. It was quite hard to kind of get those roles and employers kind of coming forward. And there was actually a bit of a lot more on that employer engagement piece to company. Some of this work to start having those conversations and build people on as well as the, the courses were there and could be brought forward. There was, um, but building that pipeline of people to, to, to take part and to understand. So I think it plays in back into that communication piece a little bit as well that I didn't hear all of the, the responses that were on to on that one. But um, so some of that work. Um, yeah, I haven't been that close to, to uh, uh, because some of this is new. I don't know if David, you, uh, you, you might be able to jump in on that one, sorry. I'm happy to, that's all right, I don't want to. <laughs> Dominate yeah. things. Um, so it's a really good question that it's something we struggle with. Um, and I, I, I'll be honest, I, I was not totally aware of the role housing associations play in things like restart. But I mean, we, we're in receipt of a lot of funding from government, which can take away the cost of courses for uh, people. And, and, and we always write into our bids, we always set object as, as a social enterprise around wanting to support needs and want to support the, the you know the, the the people in society who would otherwise struggle to to access these opportunities. Um, we find it really difficult when we're we're told that we must work with Job Centre Plus or the DWP. So we we've we've struggled to um, tap into those through through those sorts of programmes. And any any suggestions from 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 uh, <laughs> from the from the panel or the audience how that could be more effective? We'd, we'd be all ears. Um, we have done our own employability programme. Um, the, 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 Amy's absolutely right around the apprenticeship route being one pathway into the certainly into the trades and the challenges of doing. We've clearly got to speed that up. That's that's obvious, and we we, we are looking at that. But our our employability program is actually um, around training people who can provide good energy efficiency advice um, and in a role called retrofit advisor, um, and and it's a program we we first developed with a charity called Generation who. Um, get philanthropic funding to take high potential needs um, put them through a 10 to 12 week program accelerated learning program and 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 then get the help them get into jobs so we've 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 done that program a number of times around the country with with real success but in small numbers so not at the sort of industrial scale that we'd need but i mean it, it the amount of resource that we and they have to put into making that happen really to finding it's the challenge is finding the people the right people so, you know, if, if there were a mechanism that made that much easier, there's no shortage of funding and appropriate training for pathways that can take people into high value careers. But we haven't we haven't cracked it yet. So all ears. Oh, I'm so interested in that, because on the one hand, this is I don't wish to oversimplify. We have we know we have jobs. We know we have um, the, the opportunities that are there. And we also know that we have a, a huge um, portion of, of uh, communities who are economically inactive it's that link between the two isn't it it's being able to to join all of that up um Amy I'll come to you on that question before we we move on and mop up a few others yeah again it's very similar to what I said before so we obviously have the staff we're full of we've got 500 plus um engineers across the country that we could easily upskill um or cross skill however you want to say it into these roles which is you know will help people get to net zero but if we're talking about getting those furthest away from the job market into the roles as added value to create sustainability and social value then it's what i said before um we've not had anything big enough or long enough to um access the employability programs at this stage whether that changes in the future, because I know we've done a couple of tenders in the recent past where it's been more sizable and will allow us to do that. But that was that's our approach. So the internal ones we upskill internally and don't access those um, funding parts. Okay. 
All right, final few quick questions. Thank you to all of you for that. Uh, David, I'm going to come to you on this one. So uh, young people have a, a really keen interest in the environment. I know my eight and nine year olds teach me most of what I need to know about environments and uh, sustainability, which is, is brilliant, isn't it? So I wonder whether you have any observations about how the educa education sector is starting to have these conversations with young people yeah. um, and whether teachers, uh, whether those education providers have the right understanding and the right training themselves to be able to facilitate those conversations confidently with young people that encourages them to think about green skills as, as an option. OK, so I can only talk in very general terms about that because, as always, there are people and in individual organisations that will be brilliant at that and others who do nothing. So um, in general terms, the educational, the mainstream educational sector uh, is, is, is just stirring, I would say, and, and recognising it's being told, for example, that by DfE, it needs to build net zero into its curriculum in the same way it would um, stuff that's, that's, that's common to us all. But um, how to do that um, is challenging for them. Um, the sector we work most closely with is the further education sector. Um, they face very, very real problems and barriers which prevent them from playing as actively in this in, in, in the white collar trade retrofit trading space as they should do, which is something we we address through creating partnerships with them. We 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 find ourselves educating educators and giving them the courses and that, that, that they need to do you know, the, what we've developed it's turning them into retrofit academies around the country um which has been very well received and um we've got about a dozen of those around the country now so so but 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 i mean you do have to recognize that that they're the short of tutors though the tutors that they have with due respect to them, a lot of them have been doing it a long time and they've been teaching the same things for a long time. So they they do need to go on a bit of an educational journey themselves. Um, and, and then they need to know what to teach. And that's not just handed to them on a plate. Um, so 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 those very practical things. Now, the the the, the, the other area there, we, we've got to be honest, we, retrofit needs around 400,000 people by 2030 right so we, we you know we, we say we, we want to train 200,000 of them someone's got to train the other 200,000 um can't do it all um you're competing for the same pot of people as lots of other sectors of the economy including all these areas of the green economy that, that are clearly going to grow quickly um and there are that, that that number is growing every year it's not shrinking it's growing because the amount of work that needs to be done is not getting any smaller and the amount of work we're doing isn't enough and the amount of time we've got to do it is reducing so every year we don't do enough the number grows and grows and grows and absolutely think about your eight and nine year olds great that they're environmentally conscious that might mean that they're more open to um to, to doing something in the environmental sector um but coming back to our language question, they probably don't know what the word retrofit is or necessarily see construction and retrofit and construction as a sector that appeals to them. So, so there's a big challenge, I think, there around careers advice, guidance and um, sort of ensuring that this is somewhere that actually we want, we would be happy with our kids going off and building their careers in. And we're not, we're not quite there yet. I think there's a big activity that needs to take place. I think I think you're right. Um, OK, and so sticking with the education theme and Amy, I'm going to come to you uh, quickly on this one, because we've had conversations before about um, adult education and actually changing behaviours and understanding these these different technologies and things that exist. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the question from the audience is around what can we do to help people to understand what they can do personally to change uh, their own behaviours and is there a role for social housing and um, to drive some of those conversations is the question asked as in individuals living in their properties or I think it is Amy so I don't think it's necessarily about green skills um I think it's more a, a question about education in a broader sense about how we educate people to yep. behave differently yeah fine so with the cost of living crisis that's obviously ongoing um Wigan Council was one of the first clients that we spoke to that was wanted help with it so I devised um basically like loads of free stuff 
<laughs> loads of promotional material, uh, leaflets help support that kind of thing. And we roadshow it now for different social housing clients. I think five have taken it up so far where we go and we work directly, sit one-on-one with the residents and signpost them, give them advice, general advice on what they can do in their property to help them save energy and hopefully some money on their fuel bills um, and then signpost them to the additional services we offer. So obviously we're part of British Gas, so there's a bigger um, system behind us. So British Gas has an energy efficiency team where if somebody wanted very specific advice about their property, they can ring up. Um, and then the British Gas Energy Trust as well helps those who are eligible clear um, debt from fuel. And it doesn't they don't need to be British Gas customers. So it's things like that that we're trying to do to help people through the cost of living. And then um, so that's as part of social value. In terms of normal contract delivery, business as usual, whether it's where we've put boilers on walls or whether it's heat pumps, all the residents will get training on how to use the systems efficiently, especially when it comes to heat pumps where it's a whole new technology. You don't just want to put it on the wall and then walk away. You need somebody there to be able to explain this is how it works. Um, these are the tariffs that will work better for you. Give us a call and we've we've got people on hand then to you know, help them use those materials efficiently in the home. That's brilliant. And, and actually really reassuring, Amy, to know that that support is 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 offered uh, to communities with these different ways of heating houses. Uh, I'm conscious of the time and we're nearing the end of the session. I'm going to come to each of you very quickly. One of the questions that we asked at the start of this session was how um, housing associations, social landlords can mobilise. So what is it that they can do? And I'm really keen that people take um, lots from this session. And I think what I want to hear from you is a a wrap up is just one thing that you want people to either take away or one thing that they can do to start on this journey or progress along um this journey if you like amy i'll come to you first and then i'll i'll come to you rob and david um my takeaway if you remember it is michelle obama's quote <laughs> uh, just start just ask ask for help from hacked uh, for like dave david or ourselves find somebody that knows who's got the specialists and help understand your housing stock and your strategy and somebody will help you make those first steps brilliant and rob let's go for the collaboration one start bringing together those housing associations you know or kind of located locally and if, if people want to start having those conversations um hat can definitely help to do some of that bringing people together fantastic and finally david Hard to beat that one, really. I think I think uh, it would be a nightmare if every one of the UK's, oh, I don't know, twelve hundred housing associations did this independently of what, or tried to do this independently of one another. It's clearly a, a need for collaboration. That's, I mean, the model we've developed at the academy effectively creates partnerships with national local employers on the one hand with with educational providers on the other and and also with um uh, local authorities and social landlords so we're, we're sort of doing that bringing together peace and i'd encourage as much collaboration as possible oh that's brilliant collaboration is is key and um, that's brilliant and that, that that's a great way i think to end the session thank you so much to all three of you thank you to the audience the session was every bit as lively as I'd hoped it would be. And that's uh, down to your questions. I'm really grateful for all the interaction um, from the audience. We are moving now to a short break. So the next session starts at half past. So you have eight minutes to go and get yourself a tea and some biscuits. Please don't log off um, from the session. Please stay active in the session. Um, obviously, just just pop the um, platform on mute if you need to but uh yeah there's seven minutes now seven minute break and then we will resume at half past thank you so much thanks everybody Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back. I'm Lindsay Sweeney, again, Managing Director at Communities That Work, and uh, really pleased to welcome everyone back. I hope that after um, 
that really interesting uh, plenary one with some great speakers. You've got a chance to have a little break um, and come back with a, a tea or coffee for this next um, plenary. Um, so the focus of um, uh, this session is local power and local opportunity. Another really key driver and direction of travel of, um, of this government and um, any uh, future government, as far as we can tell as well. So a strong direction of travel and something which housing and learning um, need to, as sectors need to really coalesce around and come around to understand and operate in effectively. So we were really pleased to have this as a focus of our, our second panel, and um, I'm really delighted to welcome um, each of our speakers. Um, your agenda um, uh, as delegates, you'll, you'll see the um, order of uh, speakers and a little uh, background of the organisation um, that they're from. But I'll, I'll take an opportunity now to um, introduce each of our speakers in turn. Um, we have a total of 50 minutes, which I know is going to fly past. Uh, we'll have about five minutes from each of our speakers and as delegates please think and post your questions or comments throughout uh, using Slido and um, just like the last panel we'll get to as many of those questions and comments as we can and, and it's a really welcome way of, of you posing your thoughts and questions to this um, great panel so please do uh, go ahead and use Slido. So beyond the, the sort of the, the title of the session, um, we've got some really interesting and really sort of different perspectives. And as chair, I hope that I can um, bring in some of that social housing sector perspective as, as well to, to that role in local power and local opportunity. Um, but I'd, I'd like to um, start just by briefly introducing um, Annabelle Smith, who is head of place and practice at the Centre for Progressive Policy. Um, so as head of that, Annabelle's been uh, responsible for leading the Inclusive Growth Network, um, which works with cities and regions across the UK, looking at driving local inclusive growth, which is re really important in, in the world of social housing and in um, uh, employment and skills and adult learning, I'm sure, as well. Uh, so before that role, um, Annabelle was um, at, at Bristol's One City approach and she was a policy advisor to the mayor, so has some real local government experience there in mayoralties. Um, she is a, a, an, a, an alumna from uh, the University of St Andrews and of Cambridge and um, uh, lists her background and interests as regional economies, inequalities, devolution, local labour markets, culture, gender, social mobility, all hot topics um, and areas that we uh, in the social housing sector are equally interested in covering and understanding. So Annabelle, without further ado, we'd really like your take on where we are in local power and local opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and, and thanks to the Learning and Work Institute for having me today. Um, so I'll just say uh, a little bit about Centre for Progressive Policy and, and what we do. So uh, as Lindsay said, we're a think tank. Uh, we advocate for an economic model centering on inclusive growth, um, by which we mean economic growth that spreads prosperity more fairly between places, but also, you know, between people um, and that enables more people both to contribute to and benefit from it. And at CBP, we see sort of two of the key levers for this as public service reform and devolved power. Um, and as Lindsay says, you know, as part of my role and, and absolutely central to what we do at CPP is, is really embedding practice around that. So um, I lead our inclusive growth network, which I'll be able to share a link to. Um, and we support sort of not that I'm biased, but the kind of 14 local and combined authorities all across the UK. So including the devolved nations who are really, you know, pushing the envelope on driving, you know, local inclusive growth. For their communities, um, many would say kind of in spite of, of the national context. Um, so I've been asked to, to give a little bit of background on sort of <clears throat> where we are with devolution at the moment. So as I'm sure many of you in the session will know, um, the UK is one of the most centralised advanced democracies in the world, um, if not the. Um, with some of the most deeply entrenched regional inequalities uh, very much baked into that. Um, so while our spatial divides are profound, 
um, addressing them is, I, I think, all too often seen as, as an optional extra by government and, and historically certainly has been, rather than being perceived as absolutely fundamental to driving economic productivity, to GDP growth, but also to life chances and, and health and well-being. So, so that's kind of very much our institutional perspective and starting point. But then, you know, as Lindsay alluded to, uh, in many respects, I think it would be fair to say that we are currently at this moment on the precipice of moving towards a more devolutionary landscape, um, particularly for England, uh, with both of the main parties, so both Labour and Conservatives, um, being in a bit of a sort of arms race around the rhetoric certainly of further empowering places and communities. Um, and you know, what's that look like in practice? So in practice devolution, you know, it's been characterized recently, certainly by ongoing expansion of, of devolutionary powers, such as uh, Greater Manchester and West Midlands trailblazer deals, um, and a kind of whole swathe of, of new devo agreements being developed elsewhere across England. And I think, you know, this, unspoken agreement between Labour and the Conservatives on the need to further devolved decision making. I think that perhaps speaks to, you know, in a way, the success of last year's Leveling Up White Paper, which was uh, published, you know, almost a year ago to the day. Um, and I think that was successful, whatever you kind of make of the detail of it, and, you know, much has been made of it. It was successful in shifting the debate on regional policy in Whitehall and Westminster and, you know, absolutely bringing that to the forefront of, you know, a solution to our um, economic inequality. So the white paper, um, it provided, you know, quite a well-evidenced narrative on why the UK's spatial disparities are such a drag on economic growth and on life chances. Um, and it also set out a series of 12 ambitious missions to address this by 2030, which, you know, again, much analysis has been made of those missions themselves. Um, so, you know, powerful, democratically accountable local regional government structures are absolutely crucial vehicles for growth. Um, we've got I know we've got somebody from from Greater Manchester on the call who'll be able to speak to their success in further detail. But, you know, the recent evidence of of health devolution uh, to Greater Manchester, the fact that that, you know, we now have evidence that that's helped boost healthy life expectancy in the region in you know less than 10 years is is really quite remarkable um you've got andy street's successful four billion investment deal in regeneration and housing with legal and general in the west midlands you've got tracy brabin's focus on cultural development meaning that west yorkshire now has the fastest growing culture sector outside of london and a real focus on kind of inclusion within that so, you know, there's early evidence that more devolution is leading to better outcomes across major city regions. But, you know, despite this clear early evidence and myriad examples of success from other countries, government, I think, is yet to demonstrate that it's comfortable with meaningfully letting go of the reins. Um, and I think it's kind of currently failed to curb its obsession with forcing places to compete for, you know, quite minuscule, tightly restricted, short-term funding pots, you know, much has been made by that by our political leaders across the network. Um, you know, every single IGM member agrees that this is no way to rebalance the, the country and it's holding back our economy. Um, and, and kind of just to end and, you know, lots, lots more to unpack in the discussion. I think nowhere is this clearer than in the area of skills and employment support. So, it's clear that every local area has a unique labour market and unique and increasingly complex labour market challenges. So a top down one size fits all approach to employment and skills is inevitably yielding diminishing results. So, you know, what do we need? We need a tailored whole systems approach to addressing the issue that talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't currently. So I'll end there, but lots more to pick up on the discussion. Thanks, Annabelle. That's a really fantastic opening scene set from the Centre for Progressive Policy. And I'm sure we'll get questions and come back to some of the themes you've raised. 
a perfect segue really into a local government perspective from uh, Councillor Gillian Ford. Um, who's, um, I think, got local government in her blood um, by her uh, biography. She's deputy chair of the um, LGA City and Regions Board, um, which steers the LGA's employment and skills work. So can speak directly to, to that view, really, on the, the centralisation or regionalisation of employment and skills, funding and, and priorities. Um, uh, Gillian has had many roles um, within the LGA and is uh, councillor. <coughs> for the London Borough of Havering has been so for 20 years um, and has given a lot of time to public service through her uh, local borough there. She's also deputy leader of the council there um, and has been a cabinet member for Adults and Health and chair of Havering Residents Association. So lots of um, community led on the ground experience of, of real life and local government's role within it. Um, all of that experience has led Gillian to be an LGA peer and peer mentor. So I'm sure that experience will be brought to bear in uh, in your opening address for us as well, Gillian. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just to say the Local Government Association represent all the local authorities nationally and we lobby government. And when government come up with some policy ideas, we absolutely feed back what the impact will be at that local level. So that's just to contextualize who the LGA is. So nationally and locally, we need a far better strategic handle on how national employment and skills funding is being used. And analysis by the LGA in 2021 revealed that across England, around 20 billion is spent on at least 49 nationally contracted or delivered employment and skills related schemes or services managed by nine Whitehall departments and agencies, multiple providers and over different geographies. There is no government strategy to set out how schemes like levelling up and towns funds help to grow, restart, boot camps, national career service, et cetera, should actually work together. And there is no single organisation who is responsible for coordinating these nationally or locally with no accountability over how the totality or improving local outcomes this makes it really difficult to plan, target and join up provision. And this is where it leads to gaps, duplicated provision, and is complicated to navigate both for individuals and businesses. And there should be somebody directing this. The government's levelling up white paper, which has already been alluded to, commits to devolution deals for all areas that want one by 2030, which is a positive step. But this includes a devolution menu to influence local skills improvement plans, co-commission employment support and devolved adult skills budget. But unfortunately, 2030 is some way off and the devolution menu is limited. More areas should be able to benefit from devolution and those already with one should be able to extend their remit without a deal. They deserve a more joined up system, as said just now. Work local is the LJ's model for achieving this. And the government should give local leaders as the anchor institution a single pot of funding to work with local partners to design, commission and have oversight over a local skills and employment offer. That will bring together careers advice and guidance, employment support, skills, training and apprenticeships, as well as business support services around the needs of a place, in effect creating one-stop all, all age local skills and employment services. And these can be connected to wider services, partners and support. This should be enabled through a national framework and strategy, underpinned by multi-year devolved employment and skills agreements and outcomes agreements. And these should be between government and local areas covering local objectives, budgets and actions. Work local partners would then take a whole systems approach to join up local decisions on infrastructure and capital investment with learning, skills and employment. This would be to maximise opportunities for residents, businesses and the wider community. It would ensure strong and responsive local leadership, providing local and national democratic accountability for outcomes. And working with national government employers, when that includes the public, private and third sector, education, training and employment providers, institutions and the voluntary and community sector and unions, and this would create an offer that is led by local needs, challenges and those opportunities that we know are at, at that ground roots level. Cost benefit analysis shows a place based work local approach has the potential to increase by 15 percent the number of people improving their skills of finding work at lower cost. 
And just by using existing investment more effectively, evolved adult skills, contracted employment support, and UK SPF, more influence on apprenticeships and 16 to 19 funding. Based on analysis that 20 billion is spent on employment and skills related revision in England, evolving a small proportion would make a big difference to communities. We also believe Job Centre Plus, employment support and national career services should be part of a work local approach. However, there was limited data, budgets and outcomes about them, so it could not actually be included in our CBA. For typical medium-sized combined authority, and that's a city region with a working age population of 960,000, more effective use of around 270 million investment per year, which represents 1.35% of spend in England, would mean an extra, extra 2,260 thousand people improving their skills each year with an additional 1,650 people moving into work. And to achieve this, we want the government to accelerate devolution by trialing work local when we've got the robust evaluation behind it so government can act on its findings. And rolling out more place partnerships sooner than the 2030 date that we're currently um, being given. We also need government to simplify the devolution process and offer areas better support. And it should co-design with us a specific framework for employment and skills devolution, which brings in learning from existing devolution areas. And this could include a prospectus for devolution that specifies a menu of services that could be locally delivered. For example, employment support and careers advice and guidance provide a single set of readiness criteria for all employment and skills activity and a clear pathway of the steps areas needed to take to become devolved. However, the devolution deals won't be agreed overnight and we're fully aware of that. So in the meantime, local and national government need to work together to ensure we're getting the basics right everywhere and improve the system now. And this means the government working with local government to co-design all new support and repurpose existing provisions so that it lands well on the ground immediately share employment and skills data with councils and combined authorities to enable effective planning and delivery of services with providers mandated to support integration. Working with us to progressively align employment and skills boundaries. And this includes contract package areas, JCP districts, ESFA regions, LIP areas, and new local skills improvement plan footprints to functional economic areas. And finally, to drive this forward, we propose establishing a new national and local government partnership, a work local board. And this can be made up of politicians and of officials from local government and across, across national governments. And that could include DWP, DFE, DLUC and BS, with independent advice from businesses and wider partners to oversee these transformation programmes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ford. That's a really good overview of the Local Government Association's perspective and where you'd like to see change um, in policy and practice. So we are interested in work local boards and uh, I'll come back to you, Gillian, and, and ask about your view on the role of um, social housing at a national and also at a local level on the on the work local boards. So thank you. So that's two perspectives there on the policy think tank and the local government Moving on then to our, our final speaker before we go to questions and conversation, I'm really pleased to welcome um, Chris Fletcher, who is Policy Director from the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce. Chambers of Commerce, of course, are a really important part of this picture. Um, and I'll, I'll take Chris back to before his Chamber of Commerce to, to reflect that he spent 16 years at NatWest Bank, who I'm sure we all know, in a variety of roles in business manager and development positions, supporting startups. So lots of um, early and solid experience in business and management um, and, and new business. He then moved to a business education charity for, called Young Enterprise, which was supporting younger enterprises and businesses, and then moved into the uh, GM Chambers of Commerce. So uh, Chris is clearly now as policy director and uh, campaigns and community communications director, brings some real solid experience of uh, business life and uh, supporting businesses, as well as that broader view from across the chamber of um, the employer's sector. 
um, we can't sort of get away from the fact and wouldn't want to that employers are absolutely critical in um, supporting jobs and growth and in particular supporting uh, economically inactive people to return or re-engage with the labour market. And as, as we started this conference this morning, we know that's a key area of interest for the government. And I'll be interested to, to see how the employer's perspective um, goes in, in terms of supporting people who might need a little bit more support to get back into work. Um, Chris knows inside out the area um, and, uh, and is all over his GM Chamber of Commerce uh, remit. So Chris, I can't wait to hear that perspective Perspective and perhaps just your general chamber's um, experience um, on, on local power and local opportunity. So thank you, Chris. Great, Lindsay. Thanks very much. No pressure uh, on that one then. So anyway, uh, no, it's, it's, it's great to uh, be here today and to be speaking about this. And I can refer to what Annabelle said and also what Gillian's just said as well uh, over the next couple of minutes. I'll keep it relatively brief, then we can get on to questions and just give you some sort of um, highlights and, and, and views on this. Um, Great Master Chamber is the largest chamber of commerce in, in the UK and we cover the whole uh, uh, 10 districts that make up Greater Manchester. We work closely with the combined authority and also the mayor's office uh, and picking up on Annabelle's points around devolution and the deeper devolution deal and one thing or another. We are watching that uh, with great interest to see what comes out of it. Um, I guess when you're looking at employment and skills, the bit that brings providers with employees together is a little bit like the Holy Grail. There's been a lot of attempts at it over the years. Some have stuck around longer than others, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the real crux of this, isn't it? We'd need that accurate reflection, picking up what Gillian's just said there over, you know, what are those demands? What are the needs now and in the future that employers are saying? Because it's all very well to have a fantastic, you know, whiz-bang structure in place and a great infrastructure that allows this to happen. That to some extent is there. Part of the problem is, of course, that the wrong, in inverted commas, skills are actually being trained or developed. And sometimes employers don't know what they actually need, uh, which is part of the problem as well, because you've got a very sort of hazy picture, really, over, uh, over some of that. One of the big things and, and uh, the, the, the main part of my job now, to be quite honest, is to is the responsibility for developing the Greater Manchester uh, Local Skills uh, Improvement Plan. So uh, I'm the contract director for that. And that plays into an awful lot of, of what's what we've said and, and how some of this will play out uh, in the future. And the LSIPs, you know, let, let's let's be, be quite honest about it. There's a very simple uh, objective behind the LSIPs, and that's basically to make sure uh, that those, you know, um, uh, the the needs of local labour markets is being met by provision. And the DFE used a fantastic phrase about there being an ongoing dialogue between providers and employers. Uh, and that's the bit that perhaps has been missing up to now. There's been attempts to do this in the past, but they've not been sustainable. And that's the key part to this along with a better structure in place to make sure that more local funds can be put where they're most needed. So it's a mixture of everything really that uh, has been said so far. The work itself, we've got to get our LSIP done by the end of May. That goes into uh, the DFE for approval. And once that happens, we will get a, a period between sort of June, July this year and March 2025 for delivery and review. So whatever those priorities are that come out of that, uh, we, we've got a couple of years to uh, to work on them. I think, to be quite honest with the LSIPs, we have had some issues with people saying, well, hang on, I mean, it's just another skill survey. It's just something else. We've seen this before. It's all been done before and one thing and another. It has up to a certain point, but I think this time around, with the sort of there's a little bit more statutory um, inclusion with them. For example, uh, you know they were mentioned in the Skills and Post 16 Education Act uh, that came into into power in April last year. If you're an FE college or you're delivering publicly funded FE courses, you've got your accountability agreements, uh, which when they go into DFE at the end of May, have to refer to the priorities that are being identified in the LSIP. You know, and we're led to believe as well that you know in combined authorities and other authorities that uh, have got LSIPs uh, attached to them, that future economic plans will have to refer to what, it, you know, what's actually stated in the LSIP as being a priority. So we, we've got a little 
you know, we've got some more teeth, as it were, this time around. What we're saying is, you know, let us do the work with employers, with providers to get them working together to identify what needs doing. But then we also need a system in place as to how that gets done. And of course, in Greater Manchester, we saw the uh, announcement from Andy Burnham just before Christmas as part of the devolution deal about this idea about an integrated technical skill city region, you know, big focus on T levels, big focus on apprenticeship, big focus on A levels. But to do that, going back to, I think, what Annabelle said, we've got to get governments in a position where they are happy to let go both funding and control. And that's the bit that is still the sticking point in a lot of this. And it's interesting to hear from Gillian uh, about the work local uh, uh, proposals, because the more we can release from central government, the more we can get those plans going. And the other thing I'll just say about LSIP uh, before, before I stop is that while it is a Greater Manchester plan, we are working individually with all 10 local districts that make up Greater Manchester, because labour markets are very varied they change not just from district to district but within districts as well and um, what might be a, a key priority in one may not necessarily be so in the adjoining ones so what we're doing is really working with all 10 local authorities and local colleges at that local level and then we'll aggregate that up to the greater manchester picture because we think that's the best way of doing it it's causing more work for us, but we think that's the right way that this needs to be done. And we're getting a real lot of engagement now from employers when they understand the importance of this. And they're now really beginning to come forward to, to take part in that. So we are poised, uh, I think, on something big and quite significant. If we can get those uh, more powers and the funding uh, from government as part of that devolution deal, we will at last, I think, finally begin to make some inroads into this ever-present problem of, you know, employers, skills, employment, and all the rest of it that goes with it, because something does need to change from what we've had previously. Oh, thanks, Chris. It, it, that's a great overview, and I'd agree. It's that we certainly do need some change, and there's been a lot of... Um, not quite sure if it's full starts, but a lot of understanding of the issues of disconnection of, of funding pots and streams nationally and locally, but not a lot of um, real commitment or work undertaken to stitch those those things together. So it feels like the the LSIPs, the local skills and investment plans this year might actually begin to make a material difference to the connections between employers and labour market and skills and people and colleges and learners who might need those pathways to be clearer and better developed to, to move into real new jobs um, and existing jobs uh, rather than that real disconnect between learners and, and the job market, which is well known and, and sort of well, unfortunately, very well versed over the last few decades. So thanks, Chris. I'm just going to take quick prerogatives, Chair, to sort of mention the role of social housing in this place and space. Obviously, uh, local housing, whether they um, a housing association or provider is national or very regionally specific, all have a real understanding and consideration of local area of neighbourhood and place and streets and buildings, because it's absolutely the fabric of our work. So no matter the size or scale or footprint of a housing uh, body, um, a social housing provider, they understand local and can operate locally as well um, really positively. Um, so I, th I think my brief perspective on that, um, on the, the direction of travel um, is that it's welcome. If I look back to um, the early commissioning, say, of ma major national employment and skills programmes that came about um, in what was a new Conservative Lib Dem government, so around 2010, things like the work programme, big national skills programmes, they, they had their use, but they were, to be honest, very out of reach, really ineffective in the social housing footprint and were largely underutilised as an opportunity within social housing because of their scale um, and, and the, the nature of the contracts. So it felt like there was a real missed opportunity there for social housing, who, as Stephen said at the start, house one in four economically inactive working age adults can see the need and do take steps to support working age adults in their communities towards skills, pathways, 
confidence, um, basic skills, literacy, numeracy, digital, all of those things are moving people on and through. But we're largely doing it in isolation of things like the work programme and probably alongside but not in deep partnership with um, adult skills and learning providers who were driven by the adult education budget. So we've seen those lines of, of activity um, going along um, almost ex exclusive of each other and are really keen that the local perspective works naturally better for social housing, but that social housing need to be brought into those st those structures uh, and those opportunities. So it, it be that um, a role on the local skills investment plan as an employer or as a conduit to local people who need those opportunities, we hope to see a better integration uh, with chambers of commerce, with local government um, and through national policy, but which is driven locally. Um, so we're for communities at work, from my perspective, really keen to support that. Um, and at the moment, see it as an opportunity. Perhaps the door is opening a little bit more than it has done previously, but it's it still doesn't feel that the sector is really walking in towards it or is welcome, you know, is welcomed in and is shown the way. So we're really keen that housing is is um, at the table, really, in those conversations, describing what it does for its communities in terms of direct delivery and partnership delivery, but also the perspective of supporting more uh, local economically inactive people who badly need support and opportunity to actually reach out and get those opportunities that are being created in local areas. So I just wanted to share that perspective from communities that work with, with our panel and, um, and speakers. Um, a, a quick, hopefully easy point um, to uh, Councillor Gillian Ford to, to share some of the, uh, not exactly your notes, but the uh, sources of, of the information. Uh, there's some comments to of who um, would like to just see the reports and the analysis that you're referring to, Gillian. I'm sure they're published LGA reports, so that would be really welcome if you could share those links. We'll That's make right, sure yes, we, we can get the link shared so that everybody Brilliant. can have access to those. Yeah, thank you very much. No so if um, if you don't mind, I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask every uh, panellist a question about um, your view of the social housing sector and how it integrates or doesn't integrate in the um, housing learning skills uh, sort of top line um, uh, name for our conference. I'd be really interested just to know your perspectives um, of how social housing operates in your area in learning and skills work um, rather than you know any other sort of general area of social housing and if and how you see opportunities to better integrate and create partnerships between the housing learning and skills sectors and operators within your area um, you may have touched on some of the ideas already but I'd just like to get a particular view on that if you don't mind um, and um, I'm happy to take that in any order that, that you wish to uh, jump in but it'd be great to hear from all of you. Uh, Gillian, thank you. Uh, do go ahead. Thank you. I, I think it's clear to say that uh, local authorities get that housing is, is a, a really key part of, of an area. And we're, we're fully aware of the, the many barriers that some individuals face um, in getting into the jobs market and with the un, un, uh, long term unemployed. The, we need to have that bespoke uh, piece of work around the individuals. And that's we, we can design things at that local level. We are an anchor institution, so we know how to deliver and create more integrated support. And we need to build around the individuals, and that can be with services and agencies, such as public health with smoking cessation, drug and alcohol addiction, housing, health skills, training, uh, and the management. And housing should absolutely be part of our work local piece of work going forward. So I, I think the buy-in is absolutely there from local government's perspective. Thank you. That's really uh, welcome, Councillor Ford. We'll uh, gladly take you up on that. Great. Um, Annabelle? Yeah, I'm happy to um, come in on that. I mean, I, I agree with Gillian that certainly, you know, local authorities are using the levers that they have at their disposal to link um, social housing to learning and work and skills, but also to health as well, um, which, you know, we know that at the moment, you know, in the UK, we uh, have you know, an extremely unhealthy population. Um, so, you know, new working age disability claimants, 
doubled between 2021 and 2022 at more or less every age um, and for most major conditions. Um, and we've also got economic inactivity amongst workers over 50 in particular, um, rising because of ill health with, you know, really major geographical differences correlating with deprivation. Um, and, you know, we know that housing is one of the most important uh, social determinants of health. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the, the levers that local authorities have around social housing need to be vastly improved. Um, and, you know, hopefully kind of both both sides of the political spectrum will be looking at that around kind of devolution. Um, but also, I think, you know, whenever we're talking about housing, I think that the private rental sector gets um, a little bit lost mm. um, and doesn't seem to be sort of at the forefront of these debates often. And, you know, we've got 4.4 million households in England who rent their homes privately. Um, one in seven private renters had their rent raised within the space of one month, you know, when the last analysis was done. Um, and, you know, research has found that private tenants, wider experiences of housing precarity, inability for, to fulfill basic human need for a home that provides more than, than temporary shelter, that has a devastating impact on both physical and mental health. Um, and that in turn, you know, affects people's ability to um, to to work and to kind of stay in work and to progress in work. So I, I would say that something that that we need to look at immediately and that government needs to look at immediately is um, enshrining the renters reform bill, which has been kind of floating around since 2019. It was a key <coughs> manifesto commitment um, of the Conservative government in 2019 but it has yet to be enshrined and that gives a, a minimum um, level of conditions for security in, in the private rental sector too. So um, yeah, just to kind of recognise yeah. the importance of that sector too. No, oh, thanks Annabelle. And sorry, on that final point, is that um, coming through into the private rental sector as legislation or not yet? Well, so this is the thing, It's it's been, uh, kind of basically delayed uh, indefinitely yeah. kind of because of, of COVID and, uh, you know, various different uh, instabilities in, in our political landscape. So, you know, there's there's a strong kind of campaigning push for this to be brought through um, as soon as possible. And I think it's imperative that it is. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Annabelle, for, um, for your comments. And, and in general terms there, we, in terms of working with social housing, you're working with the willing, um, at least. So, yeah, we're glad to to know that you will consider uh, partnerships and advocate for that with DLUC officials, etc. as well. Chris, your perspective, please. Um, yeah, I, I echo what, what's been said already, I think, from the point of view of recognition of the sector. I think it is there, certainly amongst local authorities. I just want to sort of come at it from a slightly different angle. I referred to a conversation a couple of years ago with, a, with one of the major providers, uh, and there was real concern then over things, for example, uh, around retrofits and upkeep of the properties, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously in this day and age, uh, you know, if we'd had that conversation now, that would be look very different when it comes to things like energy costs and things like that, and especially in Greater Manchester, where there is a real big emphasis being put on zero carbon, net zero, et cetera. And a big part of that is looking at, at the housing stock. Um, and part of the issue is that there just simply aren't enough people with the right skills to do the work in the time necessary. That refers back to the quality uh, of the housing and, and it's, got to, it's got to get ahead of, of where it currently is to make sure that the people uh, that, that live in, in those properties don't suffer ill health through uh through through anything um uh, around the stock so it's a very very complex picture uh but i think that if we can identify how we can begin to tackle that it will create a, a natural ready progression of people with those skills mm -hmm. in that sector that can then go further afield and begin to look at, at, at the rest of the housing stock in, in GM. Uh, it, it needs to be sort of brought together, though, a little bit better, I think, than uh, than maybe it currently has. Uh, and also, again, you know, as, as a source of, of um, employees for business as well. I do sometimes feel that it gets a little bit, you know, passed over really in, in, in that. 
our view again from the chamber and speaking with employees is it's almost like you you know leave no stone unturned if you're looking for people with the right skills if you're looking for people with the right mindset to get back into work you've got to look at all the opportunities uh, that are out there and i'm not sure if that's perhaps developed enough uh, as as it should be yeah well thank you chris and thanks for reflecting on that i, I think we'd probably agree with you there that more work needs to be done to understand how you drive opportunities towards uh, people, households and communities that are ready to take them up. Um, um, and that's a different type of driver and a different type of support to that, which enables employers to articulate what they need and, and allows training providers to develop and deliver that. Um, but of course, it's the, the final and most important part of the puzzle is, is the people to fill those opportunities and develop growth and, and develop local areas and regions. OK, thank you, all of you, for, for your comments there. I'm just going to go to a question that we've we've had in from um, our audience. It, it mentions um, something, Annabelle, that you said. So uh, Annabelle mentions how tough it can be on regions that they have to bid against each other for very limited central government funding, um, which I'm sure you might all have experienced or agree with. Um, so with that in mind, um, how can we develop key partnerships effectively? What do you think is one key thing regions can do right now to ensure they're tapping into all available funding from government and, and doing that effectively? So, Annabelle, if we could start with you, but equally, um, uh, Gillian or Chris, if you have a perspective, please just uh, let me know. Uh, Annabelle, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Chris has a view on that. I mean, in terms of of sort of what we're advocating for and, and actually we're, we're going to be putting out a joint statement from our political leaders um, in the coming weeks linked to the budget around, um, you know, we need to put an end to competitive bid, bidding processes. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of the the one of the number one asks that my members have, you know, across the political spectrum, across um, the whole of the UK, um, you know, places and regions. And, and, you know, I'm sure Gillian will uh, agree with this. They don't see each other as, as competitors. They see each other as collaborators um, and they don't want to be pitted against one another. And, you know, my network, the IGN kind of looks to enable that collaboration. Um, but, you know, in terms of kind of how places, how particularly leaders are working, uh, you know, across um, silos and across different institutions to address the sort of, uh, you know, chaos of, of sort of sovereignty and strategies that we have at the moment. There are some really exciting approaches coming out from across our membership. Um, and I'll just refer to um, Bristol, where I, I worked for a long time uh, for the Mayor Marvin Rees. Um, who I know works with with Gillian on the um, Cities and Regions Board of the LGA. Um, so, you know, his kind of a, approach to ensure that what people receive from the city is more than the sum of their parts and to ensure that the funding that is available is, is leveraged and maximised as a catalyst to kind of drive further investment, whether that's actual kind of in terms of money, but also in terms of uh, capacity, you know, um, of the kind of um, talent that we have in the city, I guess. So we established a few years ago something called the One City Approach, which is a sort of a whole city, you know, public, private, VCSE, education, communities approach to what do we want our city to look like in 50 years? What do we want people's experiences of, of life in Bristol to be like? Um, and, you know, that's ambitious. It's iterative. Um, the crux of that was something called the One City Plan, which I can share a link to, which is a plan uh, completely uh, co-created co with, with all, of, all of our kind of partners across the city um, that kind of sets out from now until 2050 um, iterative goals across, you know, six key themes. And, you know, we've got various different boards. Um, that are kind of um, made up of, of city leaders in kind of all different areas and communities as well um, as kind of innovators and um, people who kind of often have the solutions to these challenges themselves. Um, and I think having that formalized structure has been absolutely pivotal to enabling us to kind of get the most out of funding and development and actually to kind of take risks 
Um, so the City Leap is a great example of that, um, which I'm sure some people will have heard of on the call. So that's an innovative partnership between the council and the private sector, um, investing and enabling uh, the city's ambitious net zero goals. So I would say having those formalised structures in place for partnership um, is absolutely vital. And, you know, not being afraid to kind of have an ambitious goal, you know, as is also the case with with kind of Andy Burnham's leadership in in GM. It, it's OK to kind of be iterative and to recognise that long term plans can change. But I think just get together and, and have a plan in the first place. Mm. Thank, thank you, Annabelle. That's a really helpful guys and and please do drop a, a link in um, we'll make sure that gets shared to all delegates for the the Bristol plan thank you um Chris Annabelle mentioned you might have a perspective so I'm going to put you on the spot and, and ask please <laughs> and then come yeah. to you um I, I I really agree with what a lot Annabelle has said really um to be quite honest uh, I think the whole process of competitive bidding for government funding is one of the most short-sighted ridiculous mm-hmm. policies that there's been for many a year, and it's actually hindered progress far more than um, you know, far more than than promoted it. To be quite honest, um, as the sort of you know grandfathers of, of, of the devolution deal, as it were, in in Greater Manchester, you know, let's let's be honest, it's taken up to now for things to really begin to work. These are not overnight solutions, but there has been a, a clear, consistent plan in place. It's not being done to the exclusion of other places. Obviously, if you look at what the the the, the sort of M62 corridor now with Tracy Brabin, Steve Rother, and Andy Burnham or whatever, there's some really good stuff happening there. And uh, obviously, you know, with Andy Street in in the West Midlands as well, you know. So it's not about competitive. This competitive bidding thing is is a it is a product that that was dreamed up in Whitehall, to be quite honest. And it's not how people work. It's not how people who understand the local areas work and understand what they actually need um so i think you know where, where we are in greater manchester is really good um it is working we've got some things now we can show that this is the benefit from it just going back to the lsip I, I get asked an awful lot over well you know what 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 do you want as your kpis and this that and the other to be quite honest we'll not have anything to show from some of this for a couple of years and people have got to understand that that this work takes time for it to actually come through and begin to move we've got the the new franchise bus system beginning to be rolled out from september this year we've got hopefully you know some some new elements of, of the deeper devolution deal to come through um so where you've got people that uh, uh, understand what's needed and you've got the right structures in place you can make an awful lot happen with government funding but with an awful lot of help and support from on the ground as well um mm-hmm. so you know like i said the idea of, of pitting areas and cities against each other for who gets what and quite often the pots of money on offer are, 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 are risible to be quite honest mm-hmm. uh, it's just completely wrong there's got to be that connection though there's got to be that communication there's got to be i think annabelle used the word collaboration that's what it's all about because that's what we see within city regions and also between city regions uh, and to be quite honest you know like i said the the, the sooner that the central government actually sees what's going on and understands that then the better Oh, thanks, Chris. And before I go to Gillian, just a quick question. In terms of that frustration around bidding for small pots of local funding, um, is that being fed back to um, central government, to DLUC or other departments in terms of the frustration? Is that something yeah. you're... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. and we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. the combined authorities do, and I understand yeah. that there is, yeah. you know, obviously that feedback back. But wherever we can, we, we're also saying the system is is just it just yeah. doesn't work it, it, it's you know it's designed to uh foil uh progress as opposed to promote it and mm. that cannot be right yeah oh, thank you that that's um a slightly sort of you know it's a challenging um view and and we agree with it um it would be interesting to see how they might uh fix that or how a new uh, government administration comes in to fix that thank you very much um almost then to closing thoughts and comments really we have to councillor ford um any uh, final perspective from you please thank you i i think the honeypot bidding um is just a, a fail 
complete fail. And the LGA have been lobbying for a quite considerable time now against that. There is inequalities within the process because some authorities have more funding than others. Um, They can get uh, more staff to be able to submit the bids Mm -hmm. and the cost of a bid and to fail is, is immense for local authorities who are strapped for cash as it stands. So it's a system that just doesn't work. The UK SPF, um, which is the, the replacement for the um, ESF and the ERDF um, is great that we've got one. However, it just doesn't go anywhere near the level of funding that we had with that. So, and the support that that gives to local authorities, um, again, was immense. The difficulty with the UK SPF is that that um, cannot be deployed until 2024 and 25 from the skills element. Um, that's the side of the voluntary sector and um, voluntary organisations. So we're penalised from that sense of things financially as well. So it's it's a pinch scenario. We don't have the devolved powers. Mm-hmm. We're not getting the funding to be able to do that. And it's a bidding process to get funding um, in small pots of grants, which comes at a cost to those local authorities who bid and fail. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, um, Councillor Ford. We know there's some real challenges right now, not least on UK Share Prosperity Fund in in building the bridges that we need right now with staffing and support for people um, on employment and skills related support, which isn't in place until the earliest spring of next year. So we agree with you wholly and wholeheartedly on that. And in the housing sector are trying to uh, build those bridges, but are also challenged on funding and through partnerships. Well, um, partnerships is clearly, and collaboration is clearly a theme. So thank you very much um, to all of the panelists for describing and showing ways in which that can happen. Um, And we'll look forward with interest to the uh, year or two ahead and, um, and how local government will be uh, written and uh, how local skills and investment plans will be played out and how UK SPF investment will run through um, our communities too. So I hope you all uh, see an opportunity in your local area for partnership. Thank you very much uh, to Chris, Annabelle and Gillian for speaking this morning to our panel. Um, And uh, thank you very much for your time in joining us as panel and as delegates and for your questions and comments. Uh, We got to some of them, but not all of them. But thank you all for posting. Um, We now go to a 10 minute break and then there are two breakout sessions to choose from, which start at 11.30. And, uh, and then straight after those breakout sessions, we are cruelly giving you no coffee break and going to our final keynote at 12.15. And then we'll let you go by um, around 12.45, one o'clock to um, conclude the sessions this morning. So thank you very much and um, have a lovely break, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, Lindsay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, so welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions. Um, been a pretty action-packed uh, morning. We got through a lot of uh, different topics, I know, and um, um, and we're now on to our final um, keynote speaker um, of the day. And we're really, really pleased um, to welcome Tom Copley along, who is the uh, Deputy Mayor for London for Housing and Residential Development and leading a lot of the Mayor's work around um, private rented sector as well as social housing and, and lots of other things he will talk about uh, 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 shortly uh, as well. I think sort of the, the role of um, local government and, and mayoral authorities has been a big theme I think for the, for the whole day really about how we join up uh, learning skills, work, health, housing, lots of other things besides. Um, so Tom we're really grateful for your um, time here this afternoon, uh, this, this afternoon now. Uh, I'll just do a quick reminder to everybody to please do put your uh, questions into the uh, Q&A box and we'll get through as many of those as possible. But uh, Tom, thanks for your time uh, this afternoon and over to you. Thanks very much for that invitation, Stephen. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, housing is one of Sadiq Khan's top priorities as Mayor of London. The effect of unaffordable, poor quality housing has a huge negative impact on the lives of Londoners. It affects our health, children's education and life chances, and it holds back our economy. It affects London on a, Londoners on an individual level, and it affects us collectively as a society too. If only we could get housing right, so many other things would begin to fall into place. Despite the huge challenges facing the housing sector, particularly recently, we have seen considerable progress on affordable housing delivery. Last year saw nearly 19,000 city hall funded affordable homes started by councils and housing associations in London, the most since city hall records began in 2002. This includes nearly 10,000 homes at social rent levels, which we know are the homes most needed by Londoners. Sadiq has also secured more affordable housing from private developers through the planning system. The proportion of affordable homes on schemes approved by Boris Johnson when he was mayor was just 22%. Under Sadiq, that has nearly doubled to 43%, thanks to his planning policies. And one of the most remarkable changes we have seen since 2016 is the re-emergence of councils as developers of social housing. Last year, more new council homes were started in London than in any year since the 1970s, and more than in the rest of England combined. This new renaissance in council home building is testament to the hard work of councils, as well as City Hall's policies and programmes, such as the Mayor's £1 billion Building Council Homes for Londoners programme and the Home Building Capacity Fund, which aims to skill up councils after years of them not being able to deliver housing. Yet despite this progress, there is still a mountain to climb if we are to build social and affordable housing at a scale which matches both London's need and the mayor's ambitions. Delivery is limited by the amount of funding the government gives us. Research that we commissioned from Savills last year found that we would need £4.9 billion a year every year for the next five years to meet the assessed need for affordable homes in London. And that's 4.4 billion a year more than we currently receive. But it's not just funding that holds us back. A limited skilled construction labour workforce has been a long-standing challenge in London's affordable house building sector, which has been exacerbated by Brexit, COVID-19 and the September 22, 2022 mini budget. For London's affordable housing requirement to be met, Savills calculates that we would need an additional 20,000 construction employees in London. An ONS Business Insights survey from December 2022 showed that 21% of construction firms are experiencing a shortage of workers, compared to 13% across all sectors. Of those, 48% are unable to meet demands, 22% had to pause business, and 20% had to recruit temporary workers. The number of construction vacancies is currently 80% higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic and has been rising since mid-August. Over a third of the UK's construction industry workforce is aged, over, is aged over 50 or above, and almost half the workforce is aged between 30 and 49 years. Therefore, the UK's construction workforce is expected to decrease over time, particularly given the reduction in EU workers. Worryingly, the government doesn't seem to grasp the scale of the construction skills shortage, 
and has failed to take urgent steps to address the issue. The skills agenda seems to fall between various government departments, none of which want to take leadership on this issue. The mayor does have some devolved powers in this area. £330 million of the national adult education budget is devolved to London. And since taking control of the adult education budget, London has seen an increase of 18% in adults participating in learning. In 2021-22, the mayor contributed £17.5 million in adult education budget funds towards level one to three construction qualifications. However, the adult education budget on its own cannot meet the demand for training construction workers. Additional funding is needed to create more opportunities for Londoners to train in construction trades to meet demand. The GLA Skills Bootcamp for Londoners programme, funded through a Department for Education grant, was launched last year. Skills boot camps for Londoners can provide shorter training courses of up to 16 weeks to meet employer skills demand in key sectors, including green, construction, digital, technical, logistics, creative, health, social care, and hospitality. The GLA is funding four providers to deliver construction skills boot camps in this financial year. Skills boot camps are suited to upskilling the current construction workforce, pathways to accelerate accelerated apprenticeships or pre-employment training. However, funding is currently restricted to single financial years. This restricts City Hall's ability to work more strategically with providers and employers to ensure we can invest and build the relationships and capacity required to deliver skills boot camps in the capital. The mayor also established his construction academy hubs. These aim to improve the supply of skilled construction workers by connecting Londoners to the training they need to access jobs in trades, professions and management. Some of these hubs have a focus on green construction. More than 25,000 Londoners completed construction training through the Mayor's Construction Academy hubs. At present, the Mayor does not have responsibility for apprenticeships funding or policy, and this limits City Hall's ability to increase London's comparatively lower number of apprenticeship starts, including lower levels of starts in construction compared with other regions. The mayor is calling for more flexibility for employers in the apprenticeship levy to make it easier for employers to create apprenticeships opportunities, particularly for London's SMEs. With rises in the cost of living and doing business, the levy should be able to be used to help top up apprenticeship salaries to at least the level of the London living wage, not just on training. More incentives should be used to reward businesses who create opportunities for young people or other priority groups. City Hall has pushed for the government de to devolve all adult skills and employment support budgets to the mayor as part of a single multi-year pot of funding, including careers advice, apprenticeships, skills boot camps, and further education capital funding, along with the adult education budget. This should also include greater influence over the skills among 16 to 18 year olds and discretionary and additional employment support services to be delivered at the local level. As well as training and education, we also need more immediate measures to address the labour shortage in construction. In January last year, the mayor called for a temporary visa scheme for construction workers to alleviate the double impact of Brexit and the pandemic on the building industry. The government has not responded to this lobbying effort, despite the government instigating a temporary visa concession for EU lorry drivers and poultry workers to come to the UK in 2021. Devolution and decentralisation are key to economic growth and prosperity across the UK. This must entail an element of fiscal devolution in order that devolved administrations aren't reliant almost exclusively on handouts from central government. If devolution is to mean anything, it must mean that regions and city regions can make decisions in line with their local needs and aspirations. So far, the government's levelling up agenda has followed the same old formula of forcing local authorities to compete over a limited pot of cash with funding decisions made centrally by politicians and civil servants in Whitehall. These are not the people best placed to understand the real needs of communities up and down the country. To unleash the full potential of English cities and regions, central government must learn to let go. In London, we've seen how limited devolution can lead to different choices and better outcomes, whether that's a rise in Londoners participating in learning since the devolution of the adult education budget, or the new golden era of housing, a council house building we are experiencing thanks to the different policy choices made by the mayor. Greater freedom would mean that we could do so much more. Solving the housing crisis will take significant investment in both bricks and mortar and in training. While the scale of this investment may seem, may seem daunting, 
the long-term savings will be significant, not to mention the wider benefits to people of being able to live in a decent, affordable home. By building more social housing, we can reduce the housing benefit bill by moving people out of the private rented sector. It's absurd that we spend more than 20 billion pounds a year on housing benefits in this country, yet the cap current capital budget for affordable house building nationally is little more than two billion pounds a year. Better quality housing will also help reduce the burden on the NHS caused by damp mould and other hazards, and lower rents and energy bills will mean people have more cash to spend in their local economy. London stands ready to rise to the challenge of skilling up our workforce and investing even more in the homes we desperately need, but we can only do this at the scale required if the government gives us both the funding and the freedoms to do so. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, lots, lots in there for us to, to talk about, I think. And uh, please do pop your comments on the on the chat in Slido and we'll pick up as many of those as we as we can. But I'm going to uh, take chair's prerogative to actually ask the first one anyway, um, which is so you talked to, about, um, you know, you want to build new homes and you're doing that. And actually, you kind of want to train up Londoners to help build those homes. And you talked a bit about that the construction workforce for example there and some of the things the mayor's doing i wanted to ask you almost start at the other end of the spectrum and think about the people living in social housing in particular which is uh, many people working in social housing on the conference today so research that we we did with communities that work in the national housing federation and the national federation of almos showed that a quarter of all economically inactive people which is a really big focus for everybody at the moment a quarter of all economically inactive people live in social housing and some of that is because we've not got much social housing and we allocate it according to need but actually it does say if you want to do something about widening the workforce and helping people who want to work back to work you need to sort of get in there with with social housing um, providers and uh, housing associations and others so so if you say a little bit about um how you see targeting some of that employment and skills support on people living in social housing and how you and the mayor see housing associations and others in social housing as as partners in all of those ambitions that you talked about as well. Yes, I, I think that's a really important point. And I, I do recall, I think some uh, trying to remember in, in, in slightly in the dim and distant past some research being conducted by the sector sort of on this particular uh, area. Uh, I think there's some great work going on already. Of course, it does depend. It does vary from provider to provider, but I know that a lot of housing associations, in particular, have um, training and employment uh, support programs uh, that they offer uh, to their tenants and to their residents. Uh, and, I, and I think that's that, that's a very positive thing. It's something that we would, of course, like to, to see more of. Um, of course, you know, I know the sector is really struggling at the moment and budgets are very, very tight, given all the challenges that are affecting um, the sector. So I hope that that's not going to sort of those sort of programs aren't, won't fall victim uh, to some of the, you know, the, the big constraints that we're seeing at the moment. But certainly, I think that's something that, that you know, we would want to um, encourage um, and support. Um, we put in place through our new 21 um, uh, to, to 26 program, sort of various uh, funding conditions, things, things like signing up to the mayor's good work standard uh, and things like that in order to uh, uh, ensure that best practice is promoted as well, where housing associations are um, constructing uh, new homes and things like that. So we're trying to use the levers that we've got um, through, uh, through our funding uh, in order to promote good practice across the sector as well. Yeah, I think that's. I'm, I'm. I'm glad you mentioned good work there as well. I was. I was going to um, come on to that shortly as well. It. It feels like um, maybe if I sort of make a broader point first, or ask you a broader point. Um, I think, so I think one of the arguments I think you were making in favour of more devolution, which lot, lot, lots we've heard others from other parts of the country today make the same argument, is that actually you can better join things up locally and make those links in a way that sort of big sometimes clunking central government policy silos you know with the best will in the world from the officials can't can't always do so you, i know you gave the example we talked about construction workforce for example and putting the skills and the housing side together you just mentioned um encouraging people to sign up to the good work standard is, is that kind of really at the heart of your case for for more devolution devolution in these sorts of areas is that 
actually you've got some practical examples of putting these things together and you can do even more if you, if you get more powers. I think that's right. Devolution gives, well, it gives us in London, but, you know, I want to see this across the country, um, the ability to innovate uh, and to try new things. And unfortunately, I, you know, we are one of, one of, if not the most centralised country in the world. If you take England in particular, of course, we do have um, uh, devolved administrations with much more power and, uh, and, and you know, funding levers in, in Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. But England is incredibly centralised and it can be incredibly frustrating when you're trying to innovate, you're trying to come up with something new. And, and it's almost, you know, you've got sort of the Treasury, usually it's the Treasury, it has to be said there, um, putting a block on things, uh, 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 you know, uh, slowing things down and, and often blocking things, um, which is deeply frustrating. And, and I think we we need to be given the opportunity to innovate. Sometimes that means that things might not work out, but I think that's the the sort of price you pay um, for um, for for you know some of these being a success is that sometimes you'll do things that that, that, that maybe won't work. But I think the benefits um, are huge. I think you've got to have um, nationally a sort of baseline in terms of standards and things like that. We don't want to race to the bottom. Uh, uh, on on you know uh, on lots of things. What we want to do is be, to be able to build on that um, uh, 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 and and to show that we can we can do things better. And that means as well that we can learn from each other. You know, it might be that um, you know Greater Manchester or something like that is doing something absolutely brilliant, and the Mayor of London might say, you know what, that's something we should be picking up in London as well, and vice versa. It allows us to to, to create, to innovate, to learn from each other. Yes, I, I think uh, there's there's a bit of an assumption that everything is central unless it's proven it's, it should be or must be local. And I do think the country would look quite different if you flipped that assumption on its head, given the, the state of some of the policy areas at the moment. Definitely. But, uh, and, and the number of hoops they make you jump through. Uh, and, you know, as I, as I was saying, this whole business of, you know, um, I think Lisa and Andy described it as a kind of Hunger Games approach where, you know, you're sort of forcing local authorities and local areas to, to fight over a limited pot of money, essentially. Uh, but, of course, the decisions on all of that are being taken centrally, where actually the people with the best knowledge and the best information are the people closest to the ground you know, within the communities themselves, not people sitting at desks in Whitehall. Um uh, let me pick up a question that's come in via the, the chat, which is it's going back to construction, actually, and construction skills. And we talked about um, green construction skills, I think, um, as part of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. moving across to net zero. We've talked a, a fair bit today, actually, about um, net zero and, and, and green skills. And uh, I, I've always, sometimes it's a slightly vague term. There's, everyone likes green and everyone likes skills. So if you put the two together, it's, it's sort of amazing stuff but um but it kind of actually there were some really good discussions earlier i think other people were less confused than i was so uh, i'm putting some flesh on the bones about what this means in terms of building um homes but also you know transitioning across to different sources of energy and heating and things like that so i just i, I know that the, the mayor has been particularly committed to to net zero mm -hmm. and just kind of how that links across to your agenda on housing and then making sure people get the skills and the jobs associated with it. Sure, yes. Yeah. So uh, what we've done in our um, uh, 21 to 26 affordable homes uh, programme, which is the £4 billion programme we'll be administering uh, over the next five years, um, uh, is bake into that in terms of our funding conditions, new requirements around sustainability, also on other areas as well, safety, design and things like that. Um, so we've got requirements in there, for example, around um, uh, net zero, uh, around things like biodiversity uh, and things like that. Uh, and they're all listed in our funding prospectus. They're very closely aligned uh, with what we um, uh, are expecting through the London plan. Um, but this is about driving um, best practice in the sector. Uh, you know, it allows us to, to sort of drive the sector a bit as well. We don't expect that this will um, just be exclusively, you know, our uh, uh, programme that, uh, that benefits from these high sustainability standards. It should have a ripple effect out across the sector um, as well. It's something that, that we really... Um, uh, that we really want to be promoting. The London Plan also has, you know, innovative policies around things like the circular economy uh, and stuff like that and reusing um, materials. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, we are looking ahead now as well to what planning policy might be, might be required in future. So there, there's an ongoing piece of work, um, you know, looking ahead 
uh, at what potentially a future London plan uh, might want to include across all areas, including sustainability. Fabulous. And and so sort of move, moving on from that, the, the other, another question that's kind of come through is about, um, so this is a bit broader about use of planning powers, I think. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about trying to get um, people signed up to the Mayor's Good Work, Good Work Charter, for example. So there's a question come in about to what extent you and the mayor are really trying to push uh, and with local authorities as well to, to make sure we get some really good employment and skills outcomes linked from you know giving permission to do x y or z or from these home building programs and mention of uh, section 106 for example yeah. i'm not sure it's quite I thought the name changed but i may be out of date there but you but you kind of get the point about yeah. how do we how we levering employment and skills outcomes out of permissions and then you know you talked about the investment the mayor's putting in as well yeah so all like i said this one is is uh generally i mean i i see this you know i think in in uh, most sort of applications that that we see now are, are you know local authorities before it even gets to the mayor are requiring sort of local apprenticeships local uh, labor sourcing and things like that as part of the section 106 agreements that they're doing with developers so i think this is something that's increasing i think there's a i think there is a a, a challenge though because it's it's great that 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 that's happening but then it's how how is it sustainable beyond just the life of the development you taking on someone you know as an apprentice just for that development how then do you ensure that that person then progresses i think that that's a key challenge actually that, that does need to be addressed so it's not just about thinking about the lifespan of that one development how are we going to progress the career and the training of that of those people beyond that yeah no I, i'm sort of i guess picking up on that and so one of one of the things I was talking about or mentioned before was about people leaving the workforce and growth in economic inactivity and, you know, where, where all the work is going to come from. Um, and a goodly proportion of people who are out of work are living in social housing, as I say, partly because of how we allocate limited supply. Um, I just wondered, so you, you talked, you've talked about, I know the mayor's got partnerships with different um, house builders, including social uh, housing, housing associations and social housing providers. Um, do you do you see the kind of potential for the same sort of partnership for putting the mayor's employment and skills programs together with those training schemes that you mentioned lots of housing associations are doing? I, I feel like there's, there's always lots of schemes in employment and skills. It's kind of a wash with acronyms. And the good news is if you don't like the current set, there'll be a new set along in, in, in a year or two's time. But that's also the bad news. And so kind of joining these things up feels really critical. Is there kind of more, more with the, with the, you and the mayor be up for trying to do a bit more of that with housing associations and others? Definitely. Uh, so I've had, we've, we've, we've sort of had sort of very sort of, um, sort of early stage sort of conversations with the G15, for example, who've expressed a view that, um, yeah, it would be great for us to be more, more joined up on this. Um, it's something I'd have to take away and discuss with Jules Piper, of course, as deputy mayor who, who has the skills um, brief. Uh, but I think it makes a, a, a lot of sense, particularly at the moment in the absence of a kind of sort of national strategy on, the, on this front. Uh, that we could look in London to um, join together uh, in order to achieve better outcomes. So yes, it, it's something where there have been kind of in, initial conversations. I do think we probably need to give it a push to take it to take it forward a bit more rapidly. Though, great. Well, you've got lots of people on this. I know you can't. We can't see any of them, but they they are there. Honestly, um, it, it's a bit strange. It's, it's, yes, it feels like we're just having a sort of uh, a sort of nice cozy chat, but. Um, uh, yes, if there are people on the call who who have ideas on this front or proposals, um, and then you know, I'm very easy to track down. Uh, do email me, uh, tom.copley at london.gov.uk, uh, and, and yeah, re re really open to any kind of proposals, ideas, and things like that. Great. Well, I'm sure lots of people want to get in touch, and I, I'm always up for just a, just a one-to-one -one chat. So, but I promise you, <laughs> there are other people there as well. <laughs> um, so I guess sort of um, we've got got a few just a few minutes um, left. Yeah. So any last questions that you want to ask? Uh, do I'm trying to keep an eye on two things at once, which I can't do. Uh, do do pop them in the in the chat. Um, I guess I kind of wanted to pick up on you were talking um, about the good work standard, and we know there's a big cost of living crisis at the moment. It's the sort of worst decade for living standards since the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, growth in the oh, wow that's, that's quite that's quite uh that's quite a fact goodness me 
It is. One day I'll have yeah. a less depressing stat for, for everybody. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's probably even worse than that now. But uh, I'm not sure the records go back far enough. Um, so it's, it's, it's just been uh, diabolical and then got worse, basically. But hopefully things things can only get better at some point, to coin a phrase. Um, but um, so, so clearly people are finding it tough. And this um, clearly affects whether they can afford their rent or their mortgage payment and affects also you know, house builders trying to build houses as well. Um, and you, 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 we, we, talk, you, we could talk about the benefit system as well. And mm. yes, we're spending more on housing benefit than we are on building houses, but also the housing benefits being capped and cut as well. It's just, I know the mayor hasn't got direct powers over these things, um, but are you kind of seeing some of those pressures playing out? Is there, are there things that the mayor, mayor can do around this? Or is it a case of trying to make the case to government? We make the case very strongly to government. I should say, by the way, I, I know I was bemoaning the, the, the 20 billion uh, pounds on, on housing benefit. That's not to say we should be cutting housing benefit for people, of course. In fact, the mayor has been very clear we need to be uh, up, uh, up rating housing benefit because uh, we're seeing more and more people uh, forced into homelessness through the insecurity of the private rental sector and the fact that benefits just do not, they just, they just cannot cover the cost of housing. So um, obviously over the longer term, we want to be uh, reducing the bill, but by, but by ensuring people are moving into social housing, it's costing less than the private rented sector, not by salami slicing more off the housing benefit bill and pushing people into destitution. That is absolutely the wrong approach. Yeah, the mayor doesn't have any powers over, over the welfare system in London. It's an entirely national uh, policy, but you know, we, we see uh, the effects of government policy uh, and the austerity that we've had and the cuts and the caps on welfare, you know, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the number of people going onto the streets, uh, in terms of the number of people losing their homes. So uh, it's something we push the government, lobby the government on very, very hard. The government, you know, they've got this target of saying, we'll end, we want to end rough sleeping by the end of the parliament, um, you know, they're, they're often asking us, you know, for ideas and, you know, new programs and things like that. But one thing that they just are never seem to be open to doing is, is one of the, the crucial things that can actually make a difference. And that is uh, uh, um, lifting these caps on, on the things like housing benefit to ensure people can stay in their homes. No, indeed. Yes. Um, I know we're, we're sort of pushing up against time. I want to sneak in one quick last question, if I, if I may. Um, which is just to pick up on um, something you were saying a little bit earlier about, um, you know, Freighter Manchester is doing something really interesting, then, you know, you'd want to pick mm -hmm. that up and, and vice versa. I sometimes feel like, um, you know, we can have a sort of let a thousand flowers bloom approach, but it's only any good if you know which flowers are blooming. <laughs> um, and sometimes we're, we're not, not that good about sharing things within the UK, let alone <laughs> looking at other countries. Um, so I know there are kind of various forums, I think, for mayors and mayors' offices and, and, and to, to share some of these experiences. I just wonder if you could say a little bit about, about that, but also you've got lots of people, particularly from social housing, on the on uh, uh, taking part in the event. Are there ways or are you kind of interested in there? Do, do you have routes for them to input to you and to officials? Or are there, are there other things that they can do to share some of those examples of the flowers that are blooming with you and the team as well? Yeah, definitely. So there's a group called the M10, uh, which uh, Sadiq Khan uh, attends along with people like Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, you know, uh, all the um, city region mayors from across the country. They get together to meet, to discuss, talk about challenges, talk about opportunities uh, and, uh, you know, what's happening in the various different city regions. So, yes, that forum exists. I was in a slightly different forum yesterday with a, with a group of um uh, 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 city region mayors uh, discussing and uh, and you know sort of sharing ideas and policy proposals and things like that. And at an official level, yes, absolutely. You know, officers within the GLA uh, talk to uh, officers in the various uh, um, city region administrations around the country. That goes on. I am also very interested in um, looking internationally as well. I think there's plenty we can learn from other cities uh, uh, around, um, not just around Europe, but around the world. Uh, and I do participate from time to time, you know, in forums with representatives from uh, other cities around the world. Always fascinating. And if, if it's uh, one of the frustrating things is, though, often these cities in other countries have far more powers and freedoms than we do here. So it's about not just looking at what they're doing and doing well, but actually what, what are we actually able to implement uh, um, um, uh, uh, in terms of the powers that we've got um, here.
Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, that's that's been a recurring theme for the day. You will be <laughs> disappointed to know, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I need to, I'm going to have, I could carry on forever, to be honest, but I think we'll, we'll probably need to let you go and, and stop there. But uh, I'm really grateful, Tom. We've covered a lot of ground um, there, mm. I think. As I say, really grateful for your time this afternoon. And I know you've got lots of, lots of people and organisations who are really keen to work with you in the team as well and to kind of help you in making some of that case that you talked about, but also share some of the things they're doing and support some of your objectives as well. So your inbox, if it's not already overflowing, will I'm sure will be here as well. <laughs> Great. Well, look, thank you very much for having me along to, to speak today and I hope the uh, remainder of the conference goes well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Bye. Right. Well, huge thanks to, to Tom. As I say, I think we covered a lot of ground there. And I think that's probably my summary of, uh, of the day as a whole. Really. We've covered a lot of, uh, a lot of ground. So um, that's thanks to an amazing array of speakers. So thanks to all of them, but also all of the, uh, the, the chat and questions coming up um, as well. I've been trying, we tried to get as many of those in as, as we could. Apologies for those where we couldn't, but I know there's been a uh, lots of really interesting discussion there so huge thanks to everybody who's uh, attended and taken part um i would also like to um give a big thanks once again to our sponsors fusion 21 southern housing and uh, sovereign um because you know without their support it, we, we just couldn't do these um these events at all so we're massively massively grateful to them for their support and um um, it's always a pleasure doing, we're doing everything with uh, communities that work, but specifically in this context, this conference. Um, so huge thanks to Lindsay and um, communities that work that work as well for, for sort of um, doing this in partnership with us. We, we always enjoy um, working uh, with you. So I think these are going to be recurring th themes for the year ahead, aren't they? Uh, lots of these. So how do we, um, in the context of some troubled economic times, how do we help people to get the right support, improve their skills? How do we get the economy growing, including by trying to get ourselves towards uh, net zero? Um, and how do we help people once they're in work, as Tom was talking about there, get onto the next rung on the ladder and, and make sure that it's good quality work as well? And it feels like social housing is like at the core of all of this uh, and must be. Um, so we're definitely going to keep working on this and keep making the case and look forward to doing so in partnership with with all of you over the course of the next year um, as well. So I hope you found the conference uh, useful and helpful. I hope it sparked off lots of conversations and thoughts and ideas. Um, and um, uh, we look forward to continuing that work with you. So uh, last thing I'll say before I just pass across to Lindsay is to say a massive thanks as well to the learning and work uh, team who you kind of can't, can't see, but they put an immense amount of effort in in the run up to today, but also on the day itself to make sure that things run and breakout sessions exist and questions could pop up and, and all of those sort of speakers turn up and all those sorts of things. So I'm eternally grateful to the amazing uh, team that's helped put this event together. So with that gushing list of Oscar style thanks, uh, I'm going to pause there and uh, pass across to Lindsay for the closing word. Lindsay. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. And, and um... I can echo all of those thanks to our sponsors, to the team behind the scene and to our delegates for joining us. It's um, uh, always a, a pleasure to work with the Learning and Work Institute. And the reason we began these joint conferences was a total awareness and understanding that housing and learning and work need to come together and need to coalesce as sectors and as partners increasingly at a local level um, to make a difference in the communities that we all work in and to individuals and households. Um, so I hope that this continues that that sort of journey towards partnership and I would encourage every delegate here uh, to continue looking uh, locally at where their partnership opportunities are in, in housing and in learning and work. Um, and if we can ever expedite a process of partnership, we're very happy at Communities That Work to take any query from any delegate here looking to meet social housing in their local area um, or for social housing to meet with learning and skills providers if they feel uh, that they, they don't know where to, where to start. So I'll sort of lay that offer out and I, I look forward to um, our next conference next year. And I'm sure, as Stephen said, the themes might feel
feel, you know, they're not going to all um, disappear or get resolved overnight. There'll be some similarities. But I think my my quick takeaway from today is that perhaps Devo um, will turbocharge a little bit over the next year or two, depending on the way the politics lie. But it feels like um, there is an appetite and an understanding that much more needs to be uh, localised and, and faster to make an impact. And perhaps um, the very acute drivers and needs and, and issues around the cost of living might accelerate uh, that process and, and, and speed up the ways in which local employers, skills providers and social housing can come together and support communities. Um, we know that work is not the only answer in cost of living by any means, but it is and, and remains a very well advocated and supported route out of poverty into a, a better life and livelihood as part of a wider social structure that we need. Um, so Devo is a real takeaway for me and, and whether that will actually get faster and broader um, as a result of um, where we are now, where we find ourselves as a country and also timing and timescales. I think um, in different parts of the conference this morning, we've we've looked at 2030 as a look ahead. And in some aspects, that's felt like it's tomorrow around the corner in terms of net zero commitments and structuring the social housing sector and learning and skill sectors to be ready to meet that challenge, which is now, you know, every second that passes is another home that's supposed to have been retrofitted with a skilled workforce, which is not really there at the moment. And, and that feels like a clock that's going very fast to 2030. But equally, um, there's a real gap right now in provision and support for skills and employment support for people um, due to the drop away of European funding and a slow start to UK Share Prosperity Fund. And in England, the inability to spend on people and skills until at least next spring. So that feels very now and 2030 feels very far away in terms of actually being ready now to provide support that people desperately need to um, to move into work and get a sustainable livelihood and progression in work and all of all of those issues and, and needs are every day encountered now uh, by my colleagues in the social housing sector and I'm sure in the learning and skills sector for amongst adults um, so that feels like we've got to bring stuff forward right away to, to begin to address that issue so sort of different sense of time and timing and um, a hope perhaps amongst many of our speakers that devolution will accelerate over the coming year. So we'll, I look forward to seeing where we are in a, in a year's time. Uh, as, as Stephen has said, things can surely only get better from where we are now. So uh, fingers crossed, everybody, that, um, that, that, that we are in a slightly better place and that there are very many willing partners out there who are ready to engage locally and make a difference in, in our communities um, and to, to all individuals and households that we all work with collectively. So I leave full of hope, really glad we've had um, heard some from mayoral authorities that so clearly a linchpin as we go forward. And big, big thanks to all our speakers, to our Partners Learning and Work Institute and to all of the delegates who joined us. We're always happy to take comments and feedback, and I'm sure something will be following um, this uh, session in terms of requesting feedback and sharing the information from today. So take a look at that, share it widely and stay in touch with us as we uh, go through this year ahead. Thank you very much.